So Chris, we'll uh, wait for uh, five minutes, then we'll start. Good morning, sir. Good morning, good morning, Milan. Hello, Premjit. Morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You can see Chris and Viren there. <laughs> <laughs>
So uh, a very good morning to all of you. Uh, I welcome you all uh, to join this uh, webinar that is being organized uh, by the Department of Geology, Punjab University, uh, along with uh, uh, the Paleontological Society of India. And today uh, I'm really pleased to have with us uh, two distinguished speakers, uh, Professor Chris Gilbert from uh, CUNY, uh, New York, and uh, uh, Dr. Biren Patel uh, from uh, uh, from uh, School of uh, Medicine, uh, uh, California, and uh, and uh, and I really really uh, look forward to to uh, uh, to hear their talks. And I, I thank all of you uh, for participating in this uh, uh, webinar and, and uh, taking your time out. So I'll briefly introduce my friend and uh, uh, professor who is uh, who, who, with whom I have been working for uh, for uh, so many years, uh, uh, Professor chris gilbert so he would uh, first give his talk this will be followed by my another friend uh, dr biren patel uh, so uh, once uh, we hear from uh, chris then we'll hear from dr patel so first let me uh, let me uh, uh, give you a brief uh, introduction about uh, our distinguished speaker professor uh, chris uh, christopher gilbert he is a professor of anthropology at the Hunter's College, uh, in New York, City, City University of New York. And he has uh, worked extensively in India, in, in Africa, uh, particularly in Egypt and, and in Kenya and uh, other places, Ethiopia. And he has published numerous papers and um, books and uh, so i'll just mention few of uh, few of his achievements uh, he is a, he was a, a, a hunt postdoctoral fellow uh, uh, awarded by Wenergren foundation then <clears throat> he has been uh, he has been bestowed with uh, the felix gross endowment award for outstanding research uh, by an assistant professor at the cuny then Gaylord Donnelly Environment Fellowships, Fellowship, and uh, and Mil Mildred Trotter Prize, Norman Creel Prize, so many Graduate Council Fellowship, Presidential Fellowship by the by the Stony Brook uh, Graduate School, Postdoctoral Fellowship uh, by uh, and uh, by the men mentioned especially by the National Science Foundation. And he has uh, he, he has received many many grants, particularly the grants from the National Science Foundation, Leakey Foundation, and uh, uh, and he has uh, he has published in journals like Nature, uh, PNS, and so many books he uh, he has authored, uh, published by leading publishers like Springer and uh, and Academic press Elsevier's. So, so we are really, really uh, 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 glad that he has uh, he has agreed to our request to to give this talk. And I now request uh, Professor Gilbert to please uh, please uh, give his talk. Okay. Well, <clears throat> Rajiv, th thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you again, Rajiv, for, for inviting uh, me and, and us, for Beer and I both to, to give these talks and thank all of you for being here. Um, hopefully we will get to meet at some point in person, but for now it's very nice to meet you over, over Google here. So um, with that, let me start up the presentation. Bear with me, hopefully this, this will all work just fine. <clears throat> Okay, can everybody see that? Rajiv, is that? Yep, everybody yeah, yeah, it's clear. Okay, yeah. perfect. Okay, so to today I would just like to speak 
um, about some research that, that we've been doing over the past um, 10 years or so uh, that has led to some new insights into Miocene ape evolutionary history and biogeography. So let me just start off with a brief outline of the talk. So I'd like to just give you a little bit of background about myself and uh, what my general research interests are. And then I will move on and talk about these various projects um, on hominoid cranial evolution and biogeography. The first is um, about a new specimen, uh, a new ape specimen from the Miocene of Kenya, of Africa, and uh, what it tells us about the about hominoid cream evolution and biogeography uh, more broadly. And then I will move on and discuss some of our ongoing work at the Middle Miocene site of Ramnagar in India and the implications for some of the new fossils that we found there for hominoid evolution and biogeography. Finally, I'd just like to discuss where these projects are moving in the future and uh, maybe we briefly discuss another project as well. So let me just give you some background about myself. And broadly speaking, I am interested in a wide range of topics in primate and human evolution, with an emphasis on primate craniodental anatomy and evolution over the past 66 million years. I truly find all of primate evolution fascinating, and I have uh, research projects spanning all the way from the Eocene to looking at the modern anatomy of living primate populations as well. I did my thesis work on fossil oral monkeys um, in Africa and their evolution over the past five or six million years. And uh, currently I've become most interested in the origin diversification of major primate clades, including the living catarines, which include the living oral monkeys and the living apes, which are obviously the subject of this talk along with their close fossil relatives. So let's talk a little bit about some fossil apes. So let me begin by discussing this new um, wonderful ape specimen from the Miocene of Kenya. So a few years ago, I was very fortunate to be invited to work on a new fossil ape cranium from the site uh, in Kenya of Napadet and this was a cranium found by the, the lead author, Dr. Isaiah Nango of Stony Brook University. And Kenya, uh, th th this comes from the Lake Turkana region. So Lake Turkana is in the northern part of Kenya on the Kenya-Ethiopian border, border. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with uh, the Lake Turkana Basin. This is where many famous um, fossil apes and early hominins have been found. There's sediments really going from the, the Oligocene all the way through um, the, the, the Playa Pleistocene at least in terms of the animals that we're interested in. There's also Cretaceous deposits, stuff like that as well. But uh, for our purposes here, uh, what we're interested in is Napadet, which is actually west of Lake Turkana. It's west of the famous site of Lothigam, south of Turkwell. And it has been dated by Argon Argon dates um, where the sediments and the specimen that this uh, this new uh, ape specimen comes from are is between about 13.4 and 13 million years old. So it's pretty well constrained in terms of age. Um, and here's the specimen uh, right here. Let me get to it. Here it is. And it's an amazing specimen, actually. And what you're looking at here is actually the most complete ape cranium in the entire fossil record. It's, it's an amazing specimen. The entire neurocranium is there. The, almost, uh, you know, most of the basocranium is there, which is unheard of. And most of the face is, is present as well. It's a little bit squashed um, medial laterally here, so that you know got a little bit squashed during fossilization, but otherwise it's really in quite amazing shape. There's only one problem with this fossil, and that is that uh, it is an infant and all of the baby teeth have been sheared off. Maybe you can see uh, up over here. So here we have this amazing beautiful specimen um, but we're left with with the problem of, well, what is this thing and how are we going to figure out what it is? How are we going to compare it to other known fossil taxa of about that age? And all you know, there's a large number of fossil apes that are known from their dentition, um, but we have no teeth to compare it to. If only we had some teeth for, of this thing, maybe we could compare it to the large number of ape taxa and other catarine taxa that are known from their uh, dental remains. Well, uh, we were very fortunate that Isaiah was able to take the specimen and get it over to the synchrotron machine in France. And the synchrotron is sort of like a super duper high resolution CT scanner almost. And you can see the level of detail that, uh, that, this, that the machine is able to pick up on the external net. 
anatomy. Even better is you can take away the external anatomy and then look at the internal anatomy. So you see here, this is the developing um, middle ear or inner ear here. Here's the semicircular canals and the cochlea is present in there as well. And then for our purposes, what was most interesting is here is the developing adult dentition. So this is wonderful. Now we can pull out these, these teeth that are developing up in the crypt and we can pull them out virtually and study them. So that's what we were able to do. Uh, on your left is the left uh, upper dentition. On the right is the right side of the upper dentition. So you can see by this point, even though it's an infant, the upper central incisor, so this is, uh, sorry, this is uh, upper I1, so it just goes down from A through G here, upper I1, I2, K9, P3, P4, M1, and M2. So um, the upper I1 on both sides is fully formed, the upper M1 on both sides is fully formed, and the upper M2 on both sides is mostly uh, fully formed as well. So we have an I1 and an M1 and an M2 basically to work with, and now we're in business. Now we can com compare it to the well-known fossil record um, of apes uh, from this time period in Africa. And it must be said, that my colleague and former advisor, John Flegel, was, a, was the first one to point out and say, hey, those teeth look an awful lot like a genus of ape uh, called Nyanzapithecus that Terry Harrison described back in the 1980s. And so, in fact, if you go back to the original papers by Harrison in the 1980s and you look at his diagnosis of Nyanzapithecus, it reads like a checklist of all the features you see in these teeth. Nyanzapithecus has very large and voluminous cusps on the molars with lots of crests running between them, just like what you see here. Uh, Nyanzapithecus is known to have a very large mesial and lingual cingulum on the teeth. So this is mesial, distal, buccal, and lingual. Uh, and you see this very large mesial and lingual cingulum on the upper molars in, in these teeth as well. Uh, Nyanzapithecus is known to have wasting in the molars, which means that as you move uh, mesial to distally here, the, there's some pinching that goes on uh, towards the middle of, of, of the tooth. It's per, perhaps most pronounced in the M2 that you see here. Um, so that's present as well. And then uh, Terry also noted that the incisors when present, and there aren't very many, but the, the uh, few incisors that are present tend to be short and stout with the basal tubercle, which is what you see in this incisor as well. So it became pretty clear this shared a lot of features with Nyanzapithecus. Um, and we thought, well, what, what else can we look at that's not just qualitative? Are there any quantitative features we can also look at and compare uh, to a, to a you know, wide sample of living and fossil apes? And so one thing that Ny Nyanzapithecus and their close relatives, so as a group, the Nyanzapithecines, one other feature that they have is they tend to have very mesiodistally long teeth so that the teeth are very long in this direction and that's that's a derived feature that's very different from primitive apes and primitive catarines things like Egyptopithecus, things like proconsul and ekembo and primitive apes like that uh, they have very broad molars that aren't very long uh, so what we're able to do is is measure the, the the maximum length and divide it by the breadth. You just get a simple ratio and plot this against a number of living apes, which are on your left here. This is uh, gibbons, orangutans, gorillas, and chimpanzees. And then here's a large sample of fossil apes as well. And here's the new specimen from Napadet. And you'll notice that it overlaps with only one group of fossil taxa, and that is the Nyanzapithecines. Um, and I, I will point out, I'll come back to this, but or Oropithecus is very close as well. I'll, I'll come back to that in a little little bit. But so, you know, it overlaps with Nyanzapithecines exclusively amongst uh, fossil taxa. Um, the other feature we're able to look at quantitatively in terms of the dentition was to look at the size of the of the central incisor in relative terms. So we took the size of the just the, the breadth of the upper incisor and divided it by the length of the upper molar. And here again, you'll notice that uh, our specimen is distinct. It has a relatively small central incisor. The only specimen that's close to it here again is the is the one specimen of Nyanzapithecus that we're able to measure that has uh, an incisor and a molar as well. So, you know, it, it became pretty clear that this is indeed a specimen. Uh, this is a, a, an infant cranium of Nyanzapithecus. And the question is then, well, what species of Nyanzapithecus is it? So we compared it to the known species of Nyanzapithecus, which there are three. There's Nyanzapithecus pickfordi, Vancouvering orum, and Harrisoni. And we looked at the overall size of the dentition. We noticed that our specimen 
was actually quite a bit larger, significantly larger, in fact, than all the known uh, previously named Nyanzapithecus species. So we realized that this is a new species of Nyanzapithecus. We named it Nyanzapithecus alessi, uh, which is comes from the, the local language, uh, the local language um, in, in Turkana there for uh, for ancestor. So so that's that's how it got its name. Now. What else can we say about this wonderful specimen? Here we have, again, the most complete ape cranium in the entire fossil record. What else can we say about this thing? Well, in terms of its overall size, it is similar in size at this stage as an infant siamong. So siamongs are the largest of the, li of the living gibbons. So this specimen almost certainly would have grown up to be about the size of a siamong, probably around 11, 12 kilos, somewhere, somewhere in that range. Uh, what else can we say? Well, to figure out what else we could possibly say about this, what we did, uh, because we had the, the difficulty of this is an infant specimen again. So in order to figure out what this thing would have looked like as an adult, uh, John Flegel, Kelsey Pugh, and myself went to the American Museum of Natural History. We got out all the infant crania of, of all the living apes, and then we got out adult crania of all the living apes as well. And we said to ourselves, okay, so if we can look at infants of, of these various apes and we can note certain features, we wanted to pay close attention to those features that held constant throughout ontogeny. In other words, we wanted to pay close attention to the features you could look at in an infant that were still present in the adult and didn't change during the whole process of growing up. So that's what we did. We, we took very close note of all the features that when they were present in an infant, those same features were still present as an adult, and so that that led us to be able to have some uh, that led us to be able to have some confidence to say there were certain features that we see in this infant cranium that were pretty confident were almost you know were almost certainly present in the adult of Nyanzapithecus alessi as well. So, for instance, the inferior orbital rims uh, on this specimen are actually quite sharp and, and projecting, and there's a shallow uh, maxilla underneath. Those are features that you see also in all infant gibbons, and they are then present in the adults as well. The adult gibbons also have projecting uh, orbits with short maxilla, just like this specimen. Uh, another feature um, that, that, that we were able uh, to look at was the zygomatic root. Now, the zygomatic root is very low in this specimen. And in great apes, it's usually very high. And, and that is true in infants as well as adults. So the fact that this has a very low zygomatic root close to the tooth row as an infant strongly suggests it would have had that same feature as an adult. Um, and that is something, again, that, that you see in gibbons. You also see it in primitive catarines as well. So it's probably a primitive feature. Um, one interesting aspect of this specimen, Nyanzapithecines and Nyanzapithecus, there was some debate for a little while about whether there are even apes at all. One feature uh, in the skull that all apes and all living apes and old world monkeys uh, and all fossil apes that are known have is that they all have an ectotympanic bone that is stretched out into a bony tube, just like just like you and I have. Um, they all have, have a, a, a tubular ectotympanic or an ear tube. Whereas earlier primitive catarine primates um, don't have a tube, they just have a simple ring, things like Egyptopithecus, or they have a, just a, a partial little bit of a tube. So um, we are able to look at the basal cranium here. I know it's difficult to see, but I assure you, if you look closely, there is indeed an ectotympanic tube on both sides here. So it just confirms that that Nyanzapithecus uh, is indeed an, an ape. It's just a feature that helps confirm that, that it is an ape. Um, as far as what else we, we can say, well, again, we took a bunch of measurements, and so we were able to look at things like prognathism. So what we noticed was that as infants, gibbons have relatively short snouts compared to orangutans and African great apes. And that same relationship holds constant into adulthood, where gibbons still have relatively very short faces compared to orangutans and uh, African great apes. So the fact that this specimen, when you measure the, the, its uh, its prognathism, its overall snout length, um, it is it falls exclusively within the gibbon range down here. It's it's not anywhere close to what an African ape looks like. So that strongly suggests they would have retained a relatively short face uh, into adulthood as well, just like living gibbons do. Another feature we were able to look at was interorbital breadth. So here again, gibbons tend to have very broad distance between the orbits 
uh, followed by African great apes, and then orangutans actually have a very narrow dis distance between their orbits. And that same relationship holds true into adulthood, where gibbons have still very broad and durable breaths, followed by African great apes, and then followed by orangutans. So again, the fact that this uh, this specimen, Nyanspithecus alessi, has this really broad interorbital breadth as an infant strongly suggests that it would have still had a very uh, you know large interorbital distance or interorbital breadth as an adult as well. And then finally, uh, overall, you know, if we were to take the specimens here, here's the original specimen up on top. We in you can see the the, the medial lateral crushing, and if we sort of undeform it uh, digitally here, this is the these are some of my, my colleagues who do all sorts of you know, fancy, fancy math and figure out how to, how to undeform things, but that's what they've done in row B here. And if you compare the uh, Nyanspithecus alessi, the specimen, to infant apes um, and of the, the same general age, so here's a, a gibbon, a gorilla, a chimpanzee, an orangutan, and then a baboon at the bottom, just for comparison, um, you'll notice here an overall shape, and overall gestalt, it looks most similar to a, a gibbon of similar age. I mean, you see the, the relatively short face, the similar cranial shape in lateral view, um, the similar sh overall shape in dorsal view. Um, there are differences in, in, you know, occipital view. You notice that the, the cranium is much broader on top here in the gibbon. It's broader at the bottom in, in Nyanspithecus alessi. And uh, there's some other, you know, different features in terms of patterns of the sutures and the size of the orbits and, and things like that. But but there are a number of features that, uh, as we sort of talked about, that that Nyanspithecus clearly shares uh, with, with gibbons and its overall sort of general facial appearance. However, I would like to stress that, you know, there's also a number of features that, that are very different from gibbons. So, uh, you know, um, for instance, the teeth are very different. The semicircular canals are very different. The limited postcrania that have been found is, uh, are, are, are different. Um, so, you know, when you actually do a cladistic analysis of 200 and, uh, and, and I think 62 characters that we looked at, both craniodental and postcranial characters, and we look at and try and assess where does this specimen fall and where does Nyanspithecus, where, where does Nyanspithecus go in terms of ape evolution? What, what you find out, the most uh, likely hypothesis is that Nyanspithecus is a part of a group with these other taxa that have long been known or suggested to be closely related, which are known as the Nyanspithecines, Rangwapithecus, Turconopithecus, Rukwapithecus, uh, I'll talk about Oropithecus in a minute, and Nyanspithecus, and that these are grouped with uh, things like Afropithecines, and these are, these are late occurring stem apes. In other words, these are apes that are slightly more primitive than any living ape, and they do not share any specific close relationship with uh, with gibbons, despite having a number of, of you know, superficially uh, similar features. And what I think that means in terms of overall ape cranial evolution is that it seems clear at this point that there are some uh, features that gibbons have in the face, having projecting inferorbital rims and short maxilla and, uh, and, and uh, low zygomatic root and things like this that have appeared numerous times during um, during catarine and ape evolution. So that it, it would seem to suggest that gibbons are retaining either a number of primitive features uh, of the face or that there's some sort of scaling issue going on in catarine evolution that results in smaller taxa having these types of faces. But if you look throughout um, catarines, you'll notice that gibbon-like features and faces show up numerous times. Plypithecoids have fairly gibbon-like looking faces. Some dendropithecoids do as well. Within living monkeys, colobine monkeys have faces that look a bit like gibbons with short, uh, with short snouts and, and things like that. And then now we know that nyanspithecines look like that as well. So it, so it strongly suggests that this, a number of these facial characters have popped up numerous times, whether it's it's all independent um, you know, convergence going on, or whether it is, again, it's sort of a scaling issue is, is unclear, and that will be for future research to figure out. But I think broad picture, what it means is that if you find a specimen, if you find a, uh, a if you're lucky enough to find a primate cranium, a fossil primate cranium, and you notice that it looks a little bit like a gibbon, 
uh, you can't then automatically assume that it must be related to Gibbons. For example, the recently named Pliobates from Spain, which is a which is a nice cranium and has some post as well, but it was it was argued to be a very close relative of Gibbons in part because it has a Gibbon-like face. But now we know that Gibbon-like faces are kind of show up all over the place. And in fact, Pliobates is much more likely to be some sort of either Pliopithecoid or Dendropithecoid. For I mean, Pliobates doesn't even have an ear tube, for goodness sake. So it's it's very difficult to see how it can can be an ape uh, when it doesn't have a feature that all living and known fossil apes uh, possess as well. So um, anyway, it's a very interesting case in sort of, um, you know, what is going on in terms of, of, of ape cranial evolution with these gibbon-like faces keep popping up throughout, uh, throughout various uh, radiations of catarines in apes. Um, and that'll be an interesting thing to look at in future studies. Um, what is also interesting about this, this analysis is uh, this genus here, Oreopithecus. And Oreopithecus here is reconstructed as a very close relative of Nyanzopithecus. Oreopithecus is interesting because it's found in the late Miocene of Europe. It's a very distinctive, it's always been not, noted to be a very strange ape. Uh, there are partial skeletons and uh, skulls of this, of this thing. They're all usually just squashed flat. It's found in, a, in mines over in Italy, in coal mines. And... Um, uh, so there's a, a lot of specimens, but they generally tend to be squashed. What is preserved suggests a postcranial skeleton that's adapted for suspensory uh, locomotion, which some people have then argued that that means that they are great apes, you know, or that they are close related to all the living apes because they it it this possesses uh, suspensory locomotion. However, it has long been noted that Oreopithecus shares. Um, you know, very uh, a whole lot of dental features with Nyanzopithecus and Nyanzopithecines. So here's Oreopithecus over on your right, just to show you I, w next to Nyanzopithecus, a couple of different specimens, and Rangwapithecus, another Nyanzopithecine. And what I want to show you is that Oreopithecus has all the exact same features we just talked about with Nyanzopithecus, these very large voluminous cusps with crests running all over the place in between, a large mesial and lingual cingulum, um, even the premolars uh, look very similar with a well-developed uh, pericone and protocone look very similar to what you see in Rangwapithecus and the, this Nyanzopithecus is a little bit worn, but Nyanzopithecus is as well. You see the wasting in the in the molars too. I mean, it, it's all the same features in Oreopithecus that you see in Nyanzopithecus. People have noted this for a long time, but uh, again, um, on the basis of the postcranial skeleton, people have sort of argued, well, is this really an Isopithecine or is it, is it maybe uh, a, a, a great ape or what is it? Um, well, now we know because now we have the, the Nyanzopithecus uh, cranium. Now we know we have some idea of what Nyanzopithecus, what its cranium looks like. So now we can go back and look at the Oreopithecus cranium, which is unfortunately squashed, as, as I told you. But here, here is uh, one example. And here is the whole snout of the thing. Uh, the sort of orbits are crushed in here, but this is pointing to the sagittal nuchal crest. If we flip it around, here's the jaw again, here's the snout out here, here's the, a part of the, uh, the orbits. Um, and what I want to point out is that even though this thing is squashed, uh, when people have studied it, no matter how they reconstruct it, it's been reconstructed a couple different times, but it has the same general overall shape. And that is it has a relatively short snout. It has a very broad interorbital distance with a short maxilla and a zygomatic root that is very low, close to the, to, close to the, uh, the, the, the alveolar plane. Um, and, you know, probably would have had uh, sort of the, these circular orbits with, with a little bit of pro projecting rims as well. In other words, it would have looked a heck of a lot like Nyanzopithecus looked like. So it's not just dentally that Oreopithecus looks like Nyanzopithecus. It also looks like it almost certainly cranially as well. And that strengthens the, 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 the tie here and all, makes it, in our opinion, almost certain that Oreopithecus is in fact an Ianzopithecine that got out of Africa and uh, evolved in isolation and evolved suspensory locomotion independently um, over, over, over in Italy. Um, and I would point out that there's actually been some re recent studies looking at the inner ear and some other aspects of Oreopithecus to point out that, that uh, it actually preserves a lot of primitive features that suggest that it's not a, uh, a great ape as well, which sort of supports our, our hypothesis. So that was one other interesting aspect of studying this, uh, this new 
uh, a, uh, this new Nyanzopithecus cranium. Finally, I wanted to point out uh, that while looking at this cranium and thinking about these things and thinking about Nyanzopithecines, my uh, former graduate student and now American Museum of Natural History uh, postdoctoral associate, Dr. Kelsey Pugh uh, noticed when she was going through and doing her thesis on fossil apes, <laughs> she took a special note of an ape called Samburupithecus. Samburupithecus is from the late Miocene of Kenya. It's, so it's supposed to be around you know nine to 10 million years old. It has been, it's right here, number C here, but it has been argued to be a close ancestor of the living gorillas mostly because it's uh, the size of a female gorilla. So I've put this here next to a couple of gorilla specimens just to compare, and then the Nyanzopithecine specimens here on the right. What Kelsey uh, noticed and, and what we started to, to, to realize is that Samburupithecus actually also has almost all the features that you see in other Nyanzopithecines. It has these very large voluminous cusps. It has a very large uh, mesial lingual cingulum. Uh, which, which, uh, which is again just like a Nyanzopithecines. It has some wasting uh, of the teeth. You can see maybe best in, in M3, um, and uh, and very, very distinctively, if you look at the proportions of the molars, and this is this is interesting. Look at the the M1 here and compare it to the M2 and M3. You notice how much smaller M1 is compared to, in particular, M3. That's very similar to what you see in other nines of pithecines, where you see that the M1 is much smaller than the M3. Um, you can see it uh, in, in Rangwapithecus here as well. That's very different from what you see in gorillas. Gorillas, the M1 is about the same size as M3, if not bigger. Um, and in fact, if we uh, go ahead and look at the ratios of all of these uh, molars and premolars in terms of their overall shape, they're just length divided by width, and then the ratios of the size of the molars relative to each other, and we do a principal components analysis of, of, those, uh, of those basic dimensions, what you see here is that at the end of principal component one, these, these are relatively longer molars, and at the bottom of principal component two is a relatively small M1 compared to M3. And that basically pulls out here in red. These are all the Nyanzopithecine specimens. And I will, I will show you the Samburupithecus plots right there uh, within the Nyanzopithecine sort of scatter. And outside of the blue polygon you see here is all living and fossil great apes. So it falls outside of those and is exclusively within um, Nyanzopithecine space uh, out here. I'd also point out it also has a, a low zygomatic root, which is again a feature that you don't see in gorillas, which have a very high one. So, uh, so we think that Samburupithecus is is in fact a, a late occurring Nyanzopithecine um, as well, and is it, just a really big one hanging out in in Africa. So, the the, by, by studying this one specimen, a, a, a very complete specimen, I feel like we've been able to learn kind of a lot more about Nyanzopithecines in general and sort of place a number of texts like, in a more solid uh, a phylogenetic framework in terms of overall ape evolution. Okay, so that is uh, what we've hopefully learned about hominoid cranial evolution and biogeography in Africa. We, now we know that, you know, Nyanzopithecines got out and are represented by Oreopithecus in Europe as well. But let's move on now and talk a little bit about our ongoing research in the middle Miocene uh, of, of India, up in the, the lower Shivalks of India at Ramnagar, and in the, in the implications of some of our new fossils for ape evolution and biogeography there. So uh, we have been working at Ramnagar now for about 10 years, and we first uh, started working there, and we were initially just looking for uh, new sites and trying to find new localities. And, um, you know, Ramnagar it has long been noted to correlate very well faunally with the uh, fauna from the Chinji Formation on the Palwar Plateau in Pakistan. So it's generally estimated to be around 14 to 11 million years old. Um, for those who are unfamiliar, I, the, um, Remnagar is, is found up here near Jammu, so it's, it's up in the Jammu Hills. Um, and for our purposes, what is what is most important at this point is, is that, again, it, it seems to be about 14 to 11, it seems to be very similar in age to the Chinji Formation, between about 14 and 11 million years old. We are actively working to try and narrow that age range down to get a better estimate of exactly how old uh, Ramnagar is. So we are currently trying to revise the stratigraphy there. 
Uh, we're also uh, working on collecting paleomagnetic data, and uh, we are also working on trying to collect more fauna, particularly biochronologically informative fauna like micromammals, to help um, narrow down the, the age range. And currently, our estimate is somewhere probably middle Chinji formation, but uh, stay tuned on that. We're, we hopefully will have a more definitive answer in a, f in a few years with, with some more work. Um, for right now, the most important thing is, is that we've, we stumbled, or we, we, I shouldn't say stumbled, really, Rajiv had the, had the very uh, sharp eye, and we, we found the, the, the site complex of Sunatair, which is directly south, south-southeast of, uh, of Ramnagar. And Sunatair is a, a series uh, of exposures of sands and pseudo conglomerates that are coming down a hill and then sort of flatten out into a plateau. And the pseudo conglomerates down on the plateau are fossiliferous, and we've collected a number of typical Chinji type taxa from there, like a couple of pigs, Listridon, Kona Hyas, and uh, of course, tragulids like Dorcotherium and, and things like that. Um, now, if you go up the hill, if you go across the street and go up the hill, you will come to an area that we are calling Pseudotair 2, where there are some exposed mudstones and paleosols, and this is where we've been fortunate enough to find uh, a couple of new fossil primates that actually represent the first new primate taxa to be described from Ramnagar in almost 40 years. So we've been very fortunate. And, you know, we're, we're, we're hopeful that because a couple of primates have been found here, that maybe they were they happen to be more abundant in, in this general area or just in Ramnagar uh, in general. And so we're hopeful that we'll find more primate specimens moving forward. But uh, for now, let me briefly talk about the ones we found. The first one that was found was found in 2014. And this was by Dr. Primjit Singh, who's now at the Wadia Institute. Uh, and Primjit found this wonderful specimen on the surface uh, about at this level down here <clears throat> and the basic um, column you see over over uh, on the left here. So this is a specimen. It's a very nice partial mandible with the uh, M1 through M3. All the molars are preserved and the roots for the premolar are there as well. It is a shivalidapid adipoid primate. Uh, shivalidapids represent a very late occurring uh, or late surviving, I should say, radiation of the, of the adipoid, of the broader adipoid radiation. And adipoids are early primates that first appear at the beginning of the Eocene. They are early strepsrines or close relatives of the living lemurs, lorises, and galagos. And so this is, is, is one of those things uh, that, that are still hanging around uh, and still hang around all the way to the end of the Miocene in, in Asia. And so this ended up being actually a, a new genus and species. Um, it's not really the focus of the talk here, but, uh, but if you're interested, um, you know, I, I can talk about, uh, talk about it more at a different time. In any case, uh, the next year, the very next year, we went back to Sunatair 2 and a little bit farther up the hill, far, farther up the section and farther up the primate tree, we found another primate. Uh, we were walking around here looking for, for most morning and I happened to sit down on this hill uh, and I looked to my right and I saw something shiny and I sort of dug around for a second and out popped this wonderful little tooth. And as soon as we found it, we, we got excited because we knew right away it was a primate. And we knew a few other things right away as well. We knew that it was, a, it's, it's number one, it's a lower right M3 uh, of, of a primate. And we knew that it wasn't a monkey. Uh, it looks nothing like a monkey tooth. There's no bilophodonte or anything like that. And number three, uh, we knew it wasn't Shivapithecus because Shivapithecus is quite a bit larger and its teeth look very different from this. So um, we knew that we had some sort of new interesting primate uh, from, from Sunatera 2 here. And then we had to try and figure out, well, what is this thing? Well, we got it CT scanned, and Baron will we'll talk much more about that in just a little bit here. But uh, let's just look at the overall anatomy of the specimen. We can see it a little bit better now with, with the scans here. So uh, overall, we were very impressed by the fact that this specimen is very low crowned in Bunodont. And that, and that is uh, something that, that, that you don't see in a lot of uh, other specimens. Um, and we also noticed that there's a there's a little bit of a cingulum, but it's very reduced. This is a very small little remnant of a, of a cingulum compared to the primitive apes we were just looking at a few minutes ago. We also noticed that the cusps or transversely aligned, and that they were, uh, they're placed on the margins of the tooth so that there's a real big wide open talonid basin here. 
Um, and in all these general features, the, the overall you know, low uh, bunodont uh, uh, tooth, a very low crowned tooth, it resembles quite a bit, and it struck us all, I think, as looking quite a bit like a gibbon. And so that was uh, you know, very exciting. But the skeptic in me said, well, wait a second. What are the odds that we actually found you know, the earliest fossil gibbon. Fossil uh, gibbons are virtually uh, virtually unknown from the fossil record. So we know that gibbons, uh, lesser apes, branched off from great apes around 20 million years ago, according to the molecular clock. And yet there's not one single fossil uh, a gibbon known until about seven or eight million years ago. And there's a handful of teeth in, in China. So I thought to myself, well, what are the odds that we actually found, you know, the earliest uh, given here by about five million years. I thought, well, the odds probably aren't very good. It's probably something else. So I thought, well, what else could it possibly be? Well, the only other you know thing that's about given size, and this this specimen is about the size of a given. It's about the size of of a of an agile given, a Hylobates agilis uh, M3. So the other group of primates that are known from Asia at this time that are about the size of gibbons and have some features that look like gibbons, at least facially, are the pliopithecoids. And pliopithecoids are an early radiation of catarines. Like I said, they have sort of gibbon-like faces, but they, have, uh, they, have, they don't have an ear tube and they're clearly more primitive than all living apes and, and living monkeys. In any case, they're found in the Miocene throughout Asia. So I thought, well, I bet this thing is one of those. And that was, of course, until I went and actually compared this thing to a number of pliopithecoids. So what you see here is pliopithecoid M3s to compare to our new specimen. And it turns out that pliopithecoids are really distinctive in their teeth, and their teeth look nothing like our specimen. First of all, the overall shape of the teeth, they tend to be very long and narrow, and they tend to have a really strong, uh, very big extensive cingulum, which is very different from our small little cingulum, and the overall shape of the tooth, I think, is, is quite a bit different from most of these pliopithecoids as well. Um, a, a very distinctive arrangement of the cusps all these pliopithecoids have. The cusps, so this is the buccal side over here, this is the lingual side over here, mesial and distal here. On the buccal side, the buccal cusps are much, they are offset so that they are much further anterior compared to the cusps on the lingual side of the tooth. So that's very different from the cusp arrangement that you see in our specimen where the cusps are very transverse. And having transverse cusps like that, that's what you see in living apes, not in all these fossils here. Another feature that is in pliopithecoids that's pretty distinctive is the hypoconulid, rather than being close to the center of the tooth, is shoved way over to the buccal side and it lines, uh, it's almost a straight line with the with the other buccal cusps, the protoconid and the hypoconid. They almost form a straight line in some of these. And our, our specimen, the hypoconulid, is a little bit off center, but it's nowhere shoved over nearly as far buccally as it is in, in almost all pliopithecoid specimens when you look at them. And finally, Pliopithecoids tend to have all of these cusps in the center. They don't have this nice wide open Talana base. Instead, they have all these cusps, in particular, I mean these crests, excuse me. Uh, in particular, they have these crests that run between the protocon and hypocon that make a triangle here. Hopefully, you can see it in this specimen. And that's known as a pliopithecine triangle. It's found in almost every pliopithecoid uh, that has an unworn molar. You will find a pliopithecine triangle. And it's nowhere to be found. This is a wide open, there's not even a hint of a crest anywhere in here. Uh, to make a pliopithecine triangle. So it became pretty clear that this specimen was not uh, a pliopithecoid actually at all. And then you might be thinking to yourself, well, wait a second, isn't there a, a fossil uh, given or a given relative that was uh, described from Hari to Younger? There was uh, way back in, I think, the 70s. It was called Krishnapithecus, but new specimens of Krishnapithecus have recently been published. And those specimens make it clear that Krishnapithecus is a pliopithecoid as well. Here's Krishnapithecus on your right. Here's our specimen on the left. You will see the offset cusps yet again on the buccal side. You will see here's the pliopithecine triangle as well. So there's the offset cusps, and then here's the pliopithecine triangle. So again, uh, Krishnapithecus is, is clearly different from, uh, from our specimen. It's also much bigger, and the crown is much taller. I compared it. I, I was able to, to look at a cast of it. So I, I assure you uh, our specimen looks nothing like that as well. So... We are left with, after, after we were able to completely eliminate it being a pliopithecoid, it became clear that indeed this specimen was, was absolutely uh, an ape. 
and it was clearly different from all known fossil uh, apes and and also living apes. So um, be, being a uh, a new uh, species um, and genus, we named it Capi Ramnagarensis, um, and we published this just last year, actually about this about this time last year. And uh, as I mentioned before, what what Capi most uh, most looks like to us it looks very similar to a gibbon but we wanted to sort of make sure so we we did our homework and we were able to um involve my colleague alejandro ortiz who had a really nice data set of uh, all these uh, all the living gibbons and the, and uh, some fossil gibbons as well and she had done a number of two-dimensional uh morphometric analyses looking at the outline of of teeth and the areas of the cusps relative to each other and the angles of the cusps, their, their position relative to each other and all sorts of things. And she was able to demonstrate that you could separate the major genera of gibbons just by looking at the details here of overall um, dental shape and the positions of the cusps and things like that. So we thought maybe we can do that with our specimen and see what it, what it you know resembles, what it's most similar to. So that's what we did. We uh, were able to take our specimen and a large sample of M3s from living and fossil gibbons and other fossil primates of similar size, as well as great apes. And we took 14 landmarks. We did a two-dimensional geometric morphometric analysis. We took 14 landmarks that you see here all around each tooth. And then we ran a procrustes analysis, which just rotates and scales all the data to the same uh, size so we could analyze uh, everything on the same scale. So then we did a principal components analysis based off these um, 14 landmarks. And what you will see is, is that on principal component one, it separates on the negative end, teeth, here's a wireframe of, of what, what, the, what, the, what the teeth look like on this end of the axis. Here's the wireframe to, to show you what the teeth look like, look like on this end of the axis. But on the negative end, what you see is teeth that are kind of short and squat with a hypochondrid in the center, the cusps aligned transversely across from each other, and the, the cusps also being close to the, to the margins of the tooth, a big wide open basin. On the positive end, you have a sort of elongated tooth with sort of more uh, um, distinct tapering here. You see the cusps are offset on the buccal side and the hypochondrite is all the way over on the buccal side in line with the other buccal cusps. And that the cusps overall are close together and uh, they're, they're sort of far from the margin, which is in part because of the, of the, of the cingulum that, that would be out here. So what this ends up separating out is you see all of these fossil texts are to the right or the positive side side of the of the graph and that uh, the gibbons are outlined here in this polygon in green and you'll notice that our specimen copy falls smack in the middle of uh, of the the hylobatid distribution and it, in fact it is uh, in many ways even more gibbon like than the previously recognized earliest fossil gibbon which is Yuan Pithecus from China which is within the given distribution as well, but also overlaps with some of these more primitive taxa. So you see that that, that copy, uh, you know, is is completely separated out again from all these early primitive fossils like Propliopithecids, Egyptopithecus, Pliopithecids, which we talked about, Proconsulids like Ekembo and Proconsul and things like that, and Dendropithecids as well. And if we do a neighbor joining cluster analysis, a phonetic clustering analysis. Uh, on the basis of the same 14 landmarks. Again, copy comes out as phonetically most similar to hylobatids. Uh, and then if we do a cladistic analysis of 272 cranial and postcranial characters, and this is basically the same data set that we use for the Phonians epithecus alessi, but uh, copy and Yuan Mupithecus both come out as stem um, hylobatids. They are, they are early gibbons. So this was really interesting. And what I think this all means, uh, putting it into the, the big picture, is I think this is a really, really interesting find and really interesting specimen for, for a few reasons. Um, you know, up until up until finding Capi, basically we knew that gibbons uh, separated from great apes around 20 million years ago, and that that happened almost certainly in Africa, where all the earliest fossil apes uh, are known from. And then we had this specimen, a Yuanopithecus, over in China about 8 million years ago. So then we find that this specimen here at Remnagar that's uh, you know, about 12 and a half to 13 million years old. 
and it is essentially intermediate in more, its dental anatomy, so it's intermediate in morphology, it's intermediate in terms of uh, time, temporally, and it's intermediate ge geographically. So what I think you are actually catching here is we're sort of catching part of the, of the lesser ape radiation out of Africa and, and into Asia. Uh, and we're catching a sort of an early window into that at Ramnagar. And the other interesting thing at Ramnagar, of course, is that not only are, are there gibbons there now, we have, you know we have early fossil gibbons, but we know we also have early fossil great apes with Shivapithecus being there as well. So it's quite possible that both lesser and great apes got into Asia at the same time in the same sort of dispersal event. And that at places like Ramnagar, we're actually catching a, a window into their their dispersal uh, through Asia over to their current distribution, their historical distribution, East and Southeast uh, uh, Asia. So um, that's been really interesting uh, to, to, to find and work on. And um, the last thing I want to talk about is that not only have we been fortunate enough to find some new primates at Ramnagar, but we've also endeavored to try and clean up some of the taxonomy of the ape specimens that have been found there previously. And uh, since the first fossil ape was described at Ramnagar back in 1924, there have been about a dozen or a little bit over a dozen specimens that have been found, mostly isolated teeth, a couple of partial mandibles. But they have been placed over the years in five genera and eight species at a minimum. So it's been a bit of a taxonomic uh, mess over the past century. However, most researchers today would almost certainly say that all the specimens of Ramnagar are almost all certainly Shivapithecus. But there's a question, is is it just one species of Shivapithecus or Ramnagar? Are there multiple species of, of Shivapithecus or Ramnagar? If it's only one species, what species of Shivapithecus is it? Is it one that's already known? Is it a, is it a new one? Uh, what's, what's going on? So... Uh, we took the opportunity um, when Dr. Segal, uh, our colleague Ramesh Segal, found this uh, wonderful specimen of Shivapithecus. Um, this is a lower right M3 um, of Shivapithecus. And he found this at a site that we're calling Rashal, which is uh, just to the, to, the, uh, to, the, to the east of Sunatair. And so we took the opportunity of, of uh, finding this specimen, we measured it, and we, we took the opportunity to reassess the entire Ramnagar sample and compare it to the similar aged sample of Shivapithecus specimens from the Chinji formation on the Power Plateau. And in the, Chin, in the Chinji formation, which is, again, the same age uh, approximately as Ramnagar, the Chinji formation sample is all uh, generally considered to be one taxon, and that is Shivapithecus indicus. So we reasoned that if we took uh, measurements of all the specimens from Ramnagar and we compared it to the measurements of all specimens from the from the Chinji uh, formation, that if the if the uh, range of variation that we saw in, at Ramnagar was similar to what you see uh, in the Chinji formation, and it couldn't be distinguished then we would have no reason uh, to assume that, it, that it's anything different from what's, from what's in the Chinji formation on the Power Plateau. And in that case, the correct name, uh, the name that has priority would be Shivapithecus indicus. So that's what we did is we metrically compared the Ramnagar sample. We took every specimen, we got measurements from the literature or we took them ourselves, every specimen from Ramnagar, every specimen from the, from the Chinji formation, and we compared them metrically. So we looked at overall shape in terms of the mesodistal length divided by the breadth. We looked at tapering, so the, the mesial breadth of the tooth divided by the distal breadth of the tooth. And we looked at the overall tooth size as well in terms of, of its area, so its length times its breadth. And what you see here is, is that the sample at Ramnagar in almost every single case falls within the range of variation that you see uh, on the, in the Chinji formation on the power plateau. And in fact, if you do statistical comparisons, there are no statistically significant differences between the two populations. And I'm showing, showing you just the lower molars here, but we also look at the uppers and the premolars as well. And there's no differences, no significant differences we can find basically anywhere. So uh, that means that really all of the specimens at Ramnagar from this point forward should really be included in a single taxon, and it should probably be recognized as the same taxon that's at the Chinji formation, and that is Shivapithecus indicus. Um, and until we can find some additional specimens 
that sh or it can be shown that there are features that consistently separate the Ramnagar sample. Um, I think I think that the correct taxonomy moving forward would be Shivapithecus indicus for for the for the Ramnagar sample. Okay, so uh, just briefly, let me discuss where we're going with these projects in the future. And uh, so at Ramnagar, as as Rajiv mentioned at the top, we recently. We're fortunate we, we got uh, funding uh, from the National Science Foundation here in the United States to continue our work at Ramnagar over the next few years. So uh, we're going to do that. We're going to uh, continue. I'm looking forward to getting back out there as soon as it is possible to travel again and uh, continue our work there collecting more uh, mammals, hopefully some more primates. Again, trying to focus on finding some more biochronologically informative taxa particularly micromammals, and just trying to clean up a lot of the taxonomy, just like we did, we did with, with Shivapithecus, trying to clean up the taxonomy of other mammals at Ramnagar as well. And then another big part of this project, which Biren is going to talk about, is trying to digitize and, and create a virtual repository of all specimens that have been collected from Ramnagar uh, over the years, which I think will be hopefully useful for everyone moving forward. Uh, geologically, we're also doing a lot of interesting stuff. I know um, a, a couple a couple of students are doing uh, work at Ramagar for their for their thesis. I know Deepak is, is doing some work. He's uh, collecting some paleomagnetic data. So we're hopeful that that, that will, will provide some interesting results uh, that will also have some bearing on narrowing down the age possibilities at Ramnagar. And we're also uh, trying to resolve and sort of revise these, these stratigraphy there as, as well. And so hopefully I can report back to you in a few years and we'll have some more information um, about Ramnagar in terms of, of its faunal evolution and the paleoecology and uh, its overall age as well. As far as Nyanzapithecus alessi, we are continuing to do um, research on this specimen as well, looking at in detail of, of other aspects of its anatomy, like it's uh, like a virtual endocastle against neuroanatomy. And um, Isaiah it continues to go to Napadet and find interesting fossils. And then one of the most interesting things that we're doing moving forward, uh, hopefully to publish in the next couple of years, will be taking this specimen and uh, virtually growing it up. So looking at doing a 3D geometric morphometric analysis where we look at all living ape, infant crania, infant uh, or juvenile ape crania, and then adult ape crania. And once once you have 3D, uh, you know, recreations of, of, of all those different specimens, you can project then growth curves, and we can then uh, digitally. Uh, again, this is this is with, with folks in Germany, Austria, who are no uh, no math and computers way better than I do. But they they are my, my colleagues are working on digitizing the specimen and growing it up, which should be really really interesting. Finally, um, outside of apes, I also do uh, other research on old world monkeys, and then also research in the in the Eocene of Wyoming, where we're actually looking at, and since we're, we're here talking about fossils and fossil day, uh, we, we find fossils out in the Eocene of Wyoming, where, we, uh, where we're doing research right now. We have another grant um, to look at faunal evolution during the early Eocene climatic optimum. So I look forward to, to continuing working uh, on that project as well. So with that, I just want to thank uh, you again for your attention. Thank you for listening. I want to thank all of my uh, all of the funding organizations over the course of uh, of all these years. I want to particularly thank again uh, Rajiv and Biren and Chris, our our, our whole crew um, of of uh, collaborators at Ramnagar, including Dr. Segal, Primjit, a number of the students, uh, Deepak and, and Wasim, and, and all the students at, at PU. And then um, I want to thank all of our colleagues who worked on the uh, the Alessi specimen. So that's Alejandra and Kelsey and John and uh, Isaiah and Fred and Ellen. And then I do need to thank in particular um, the folks at Harvard who work on the Power Plateau for all those years have been very helpful with their time and advice uh, in helping us with with uh, with looking at some of the Ramnagar fauna. And so thank you to Larry Flynn, John Burry, Michelle Morgan, and David Pilbeam as well. So uh, with that, I'm happy if we have time for any questions or to turn it over to Biren or, or how we're going to proceed. So I, I leave that to you, Rajiv. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for those fascinating uh... It's a fascinating talk, so it was really wonderful. Uh, and I know it is uh, more than, uh, it's almost uh, two o'clock, I guess, in the morning. 
and it 130, yeah. <laughs> 130 yeah so so i uh, so i would uh, uh, we can have some quick questions uh, so uh, i those who would like to ask please please go ahead or or you can uh, put put your questions in the chat box uh, so uh, sim uh, i can i can uh, i can uh, uh, yeah simran sagi uh, has asked so oreo pitikas basically look flat like the oreo cookies <laughs> i suggest uh, yeah it's, it's it's squash flat because squash it, flat, of, yeah. of the yeah. of the uh, yeah. It, it was it, it's it's found in in uh, in mines. It's just that the 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 taphonomy is just yeah. That's the, that's just how they all end up. Right. But uh, I forget what is uh, I'm blanking on what what Oreo actually. What is what what does Oreo mean? What's the I, I I I'm blanking on what the what the root of that is in um, Latin or Greek or whatever it is. I think it refers to the some mountain range in Greece. N no, it's because yeah. I, I no, it's it's uh it, it, I, I forget it's it means. I'll look it up, but yeah, it's the because the, there's like oreodonts and things like that. So it, it you know, it, it it isn't the 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 cookies, um, but but yes, but it, it, is, it is it is certainly funny. I've, <laughs> you're not the, it has it's certainly been crossed my mind before. Um, Deepak, is the size the only major character to differ uh, baby teeth and permit? No, no, no. Um, ba uh, baby teeth are are different. There's numerous features that, that differentiate the. Um, the the baby and and adult dentition so um you know in general there are some commonalities there and so you can you can usually if you have baby teeth you can get a decent idea of what uh, adult teeth will look like in many cases but um for example the deciduous premolars um you know look like molars and, and, they, and they tend to have a distinctive shape they tend to be elongated um th there's uh in terms of the the root structure, roots are tend tend to be much uh, shorter and, sh and shallower because, of course, the, the teeth are going to fall out. They often tend to, for whatever reason, have a different, uh, seemingly uh, perhaps a different mineralization. They, the baby teeth tend to, uh, when they fossilize, tend to be a different color than, than than the than the permanent dentition as well. Obviously, that's not not a great anatomical feature to hang your hat on, but. Um, this is all to say that the that the deciduous dentition is anatomically distinct from the from the permanent one. You can definitely tell deciduous teeth from uh, from permanent teeth. Uh, she says, "What are dating methods that she used for copy?" Ah, yes. So the the, the dating methods for for copy are basically um, we we the, just general that we know that Ramnagar is is Chinji age, so we know it's between about fourteen eleven and a fourteen eleven million years old. And then within that, there have been some uh, some rodents that have been found that generally correlate to the middle or lower part of the Chinji formation. So that's where the the, the estimate uh, comes from. And uh, right now, like I said, we sort of think that it's probably. Um, you know, middle chingy, so around 12 and a half to 13 on the basis of some of the micro mammals that have come out. Uh, Simran says, what are the suture size and shape in the skull? Tell about the species. Suture size. Um, the sutures, the, the only interesting thing I, I can think about about the sutures is the position of bregma. Uh, so that you know, the, the, the coronal suture is actually very different in gibbons compared to um, out to great apes and uh, other primitive catarines. Um, so that seems to be a derived feature. It seems to be, as I, if I'm remembering right, Bregma is actually much farther back uh, in, in a given for whatever reason. Um, and that's actually something that is not in the, in the in Nyanzopithecus, it's like most other apes. It's, it's, it's much farther forward. So um, that's about all I can say about that. In terms of the shape of the overall shape of the skull, uh, that, that's sort of, you know, what we already sort of looked at and we'll, we'll sort of have a better idea, I think, once we were able to virtually grow the thing up and see what probably it, it you know, project like it looked like as, as an adult. Uh, well, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you again, Chris. It was such a wonderful talk.
and uh, now we we move on to uh, our next speaker uh, dr biren patel uh, let me uh, introduce biren uh, briefly uh, biren uh, is uh, from keck university uh, uh, uc uh, usc uh, california that is uh, he's he's into uh, anatomy uh, and uh, he has uh, he has been uh, he has received many many awards and fellowships i would just name few of them uh, uh, dean's list university of chicago and uh, graduate uh, graduation with general honors uh, in anthropology normal creel uh, prize for outstanding student research in anat anatomical sciences prize for best student poster uh, normal crease prize for outstanding student certificate of excellence in reviewing journal of human evolution and uh, uh, several fellowships uh, he has received uh, and the most uh, uh, recent one i guess is the presidential fellowship uh, by the stony brook university and uh, uh personally uh, uh, we have been uh, associated for the almost last two decades uh, working together in uh, to start with in egypt and uh, he has published uh, many many uh, uh, papers in very highly uh, high impact journals and uh, he his his specialization is uh, as as he's an anatomist so he works on 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 mostly on the proscranial uh, material so he would uh, be uh, uh, giving us uh, details about how he goes about uh, looking at all those uh, features and interpreting them uh, for for uh, understanding the adaptation and evolution so i i invite uh, uh, dr biren uh, patel to to give his talk uh, and uh, uh, I again, again, welcome you all to this uh, very uh, lecture. Please, Birin. Uh, thank you, Rajiv. Uh, you can hear me, yes? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, let me share my screen. Um, Chris went, uh, was very thorough and detailed and had a lot of science in his seminar. Uh, and I will have a lot less science in my seminar, <laughs> but I will have a lot, a lot of pretty pictures. Yeah. I'll talk about uh, uh, research that's my own and um, research that belongs to others. Uh, I think it'll be a little bit of new information for many of you and maybe a little fun foundational research or background for some others. Um, and then I'll, I'll end my, my talk on um, something that Chris just mentioned about the, the work in India, but really about the digitization work that we're doing. Let me... Uh, share my entire screen here and i think that should do it are we there rajiv yeah okay yes. so so uh again thank you for the invitation and thank you for the uh to the paleontological society of india and just having an international fossil day of full of celebrations and it sounds like a week of celebrations that are quite variable um, Rajiv asked me to give a seminar on uh, well, one component of my research. I, I do many things. Uh, I have many interests, uh, not just uh, uh, postcranial evolution in primates, but uh, functional anatomy, uh, paleontology, uh, evolutionary biology, and and I dabble in these virtual methods to better uh, to better understand um, uh, paleontology in general and different parts, uh, different aspects of paleontology. So I will uh, discuss superficially, more or less, some recent discoveries in the in the fields of paleoanthropology and paleoprimatology, which are fields of basically the evolutionary biology of humans and non-human primates. Uh, and what, what our field, not what I have learned, but what our field has learned uh, in recent years using 3D virtual methods and then give very briefly uh since chris just spoke about these but some examples of the 3d imaging that we've used on our shawalic fossils and where that is going 
So just to uh, uh, just give you a background, a little bit about myself, I'm a bi biological anthropologist with uh, interests bridging diverse academic disciplines, uh, including anatomy, biomechanics, evolutionary biology, and paleontology. Uh, my research programs are extremely uh, diverse and they range uh, uh, in investigating questions to help us advance our understanding um, and knowledge of human and non-human primate function, morphology and evolution. And my re research really relies on traditional uh, and state-of-the-art morphometrics. Traditional meaning, you know, like many of us uh, are trained in using calipers and running around museums and collections and measuring everything we can. Uh, to more uh, current methods using uh, digital imaging and working with uh, live animals or cadavers or ske skeletal materials and, of course, fossils. And then today's seminar is really focusing on those applications of some of these 3D digital imaging uh, in, in, in both paleoanthro and paleoprimatology, and then again, highlighting my own and other people's research. And I just want to point out that I'm not, this seminar is not about 3D imaging. It's not about the physics of x-rays. It's not about um, the, the, the benefits and negatives of, of all the imaging, but rather how we have people, including myself, have used imaging to answer some uh, fundamental uh, questions in, in our field. So again, there's a long history of comparative anatomy and morphometrics in paleoanthropology and paleoprimatology. But in the last maybe two decades, there's been a real surge in the use of digital methods um, uh, you know, to explore uh, anatomy in 3D. Uh, and compared to uh, these advances, they're, they're, really, they're really skyrocketing uh, and becoming very popular um, in part because technology is moving very quickly, uh, costs are coming down. Um, Facilities are, are popping up everywhere, not just in the U.S., but there's a number of great facilities in India, in South Africa, where the fossils are found, um, in Europe. You saw some imaging already from a synchrotron facility on that Nalesi skull, uh, that the Ninesopithecus skull that Chris was just talking about. And so it's really exploded uh, into a whole new field that's really called uh, virtual anthropology. Um, or we can even call it virtual paleoanthropology or virtual paleontology, depending on what you study. Um, and this is a really nice, actually, a book from a few years ago that kind of describes the history and the current state. It's no longer current, it's actually outdated now, but a nice textbook here by Weber and Bookstein. Uh, a number of methods can be used to acquire 3D digital data. Um, Photogrammetry is a very portable one where you can take your, your, your DSLR camera or any camera. And nowadays you can take your smartphone if it has a good camera and a macro lens. Uh, it's a really cheap way to make 3D images. Uh, laser scanning has become quite popular and a little bit more cost effective and it's also very portable. Uh, a great way to get 3D digital data from the field or from museums that you visit uh, internationally or even domestically. Uh, cost of, of laser scanning is much more expensive than photogrammetry. Uh, it can be quite cheap or it can be actually rather expensive depending on the quality of scanning systems that you may have. Uh, the only downsides for both photogrammetry and laser scanning is that you really can only obtain external anatomy um, and you can't see the internal structure of, of your fossil or your comparative material. Uh, clinical CT has actually been used longer than some of these other methods of laser scanning in photogrammetry. Um, it started off being used in comparative studies and comparative functional morphology studies with the applications to some fossils. Um, but they are, compared to what we have now, would be considered relatively lower resolution. And still, they're restricted to medical facilities and medical institutions. So getting access to those scanners is a little bit more challenging. Um, than you would hope. Um, sort of the gold standard, if we will, uh, is the use of micro CT and micro CT imaging um, to really get high resolution uh, uh, X-ray data in three dimensions for fossils or, or any uh, of your comparative data from, from skeletons. Um, I, and of course, the, the higher resolution comes a higher cost and also some other negatives that come with it, for example, your micro CT can only fit uh, so uh, a specimen of such a of a given size that it makes uh, scanning things like dinosaurs a little bit more challenging if that's what you're into. 
Uh, here you can see actually this in, this is actually an image I took from Google, but this is an individual scanning uh, a dinosaur uh, a bone uh, in a medical CT scanner, whereas tiny little uh, objects, uh, teeth, for example, of primates, uh, would be inside this shielded box to get high resolution imaging. And I think if you zoom in here, it's actually a, a scan of a rodent jaw. Uh, and then here's an example of some of the new high-end laser scanners that will allow you to get surface data of here in this example of a of a fossil hominin skull. The, the, the best of the best uh, resolution, of course, the, the, the creme de la creme would be synchrotron scanning. And unfortunately, it has a lot of limitations. Uh, cost is, is definitely one of them, but also the size of the object. Uh, there are very few facilities that have that, uh, that, uh, that you can get this kind of data. Um, and so there's, there's just limited use and, and getting time to use these machines is really, is really tough. And basically you'd need a very, a, a really good reason for that data like Chris and his colleagues had with that baby skull. Um, if you just want surface data, it's way, it's overkill, both in time, cost, and, and effort. Uh, so most of my, uh, my, my own research these days uh, utilizes micro CT and then of course, uh, laser scanning. Um, and speaking of, of micro CT, if you do a quick, it's becoming sort of the norm in a lot of sciences, not just paleontological sciences and geological sciences, but in, in physics and in medicine and, and you know basic biological sciences. So I just did a quick, this is, I did this yesterday, and I, I did a Google search year by year from 1990 to 2020 to see how often the, the, the phrase, the word micro CT would appear in a publication title or abstract or in the abstract that's published. And you can see that there is this lot, like basically, this steady increase of total number of publications per year across the world. Now, there's probably lots of redundancy in Google Scholar, but just to show you that, that the use of this technology is, is ramping up and probably will not uh, cease anytime soon or plateau. But what's really interesting is that if we plot uh, the number of publications in, in that use the word micro CT or micro, uh, either with or without the dash in its name, uh, in a title or an abstract, published in the Journal of Human Evolution or the American Journal of Physical Anthropology, where most of most of my work goes, um, and a lot of the uh, paleoanthropological uh, 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 literature is found, you can see the same trend following national, sort of the, the, the international trend of across sciences that we see the same in, in paleoanthropology and paleoprimatology. There's obviously a drop off here in 2020, uh, not surprising because of the limited uh, data uh, been publications because of the, the, the COVID pandemic, most likely. So uh, again, I don't want to go through the methods themselves, but uh, I just want to briefly touch on sort of the some of the some of the, the benefits of using 3D methods. And you've seen some of those already, for example, extracting baby teeth from a skull or looking at semicircular canals or reconstructing skulls. And so I, and, and I didn't unfortunately communicate with Chris prior to his talk, so he stole a little bit of my, my thunder, but that's okay. Um, first of all, why, why, what, what are some of the benefits of 3D virtual methods? Uh, in part, we want to be able to study uh, uh, non-invasively, uh, very uh, basically irreplaceable specimens, specimens that are essentially one of a kind and can be really fragile. Um, and with that said, there are very few museums that are gonna prevent uh, sorry, that are going to allow us to do any sort of destructive sampling or sectioning uh, if that was something that was needed. For example, if we were interested in looking at enamel microstructure or maybe the cortical bone properties of a long bone uh, and its diaphysis for some biomechanical analyses. Um, uh, again, what Chris had mentioned that using these 3D virtual methods, especially ones that are based on X-ray technology like CT, micro CT, or synchrotron, there are things that we can then see inside something else. So like we can see structures and study structures and the anatomy of these structures uh, that are contained within other structures, specifically in, in skull bones. So for example, looking at unerupted teeth or even the, the dentine of a tooth uh, by removing the enamel cap. Uh, semicircular canals, uh, the tiny ear ossicles, the cochleas, uh, even, the, even the, 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 the curly scroll bones that are found in nasal cavities, uh, the spaces uh, within your skull, these cranial sinuses that are filled with air, uh, other cavities like the endocranial ca uh, cavity that um, essentially where your brain sits to produce 
where we can, can then study uh, brain endocasts, a variety of other bony canals where blood vessels travel and nerve travel can be studied uh, using uh, this x-ray technology. Um, even, even to study uh, 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 using laser scanning or surface scanning or, or some sort of x-ray based technology uh, also allows us to not just study structures that are in the skull, which clearly seems to be the focus for the, up here, but to study the, um, the morphology of very complex structures uh, of, of the skeleton, specifically in my interest, things that are uh, bones that make up the hand and wrist or the foot or the ankle, or even vertebrae, uh, which have very weird shapes to them and cranial bones. You know, uh, calipers alone or photographs alone don't allow us to get the full complex picture of the shapes of these bones in case we were trying to uh, do some sort of uh, phylogenetic or, or uh, functional analyses. And of course, we can't, again, peer, uh, looking into the bones uh, themselves, if we look at the epiphyseal ends, the articular ends where they have trabeculae, or cancellous bone, you need um, high resolution micro CT to visualize those trabeculae, which are very complex in shape and also very tiny in size. And speaking of tiny in size, uh, a lot of fossils that, that we work with um, and even a lot of extant comparative material uh, are very tiny um, and the 3D imaging really facilitates their study. And so I'll be talking a little bit about all these uh, regions um, in my own work and those of others. But also I wanted to point out one other really, uh, or two other benefits of using these virtual methods, again, focusing on micro CT, uh, is that you can do virtu uh, virtual fossil preparations. If you haven't seen um, or maybe even thought of this, this is really neat. Um, this is an example of a block of, of I believe it was limestone uh, sitting at the Natural History Museum for many decades. The only thing exposed on the surface were these, were these uh, bits of long bones and bits of, of hand bones. And they knew from the, just from the anatomy that this and the size and, the, and where, the, the, where the, the, the limestone came from, was that it was from the American Museum, I'm oh, sorry, it was from a taxon called Notharctus, which is a, a, an adapted primate of the Eocene of North America. And uh, they scanned, they took this block that had been sitting around, it had never been prepped because they, they were not interested in prepping it since they've already had so many skeletons of this animal. But the, the block was prepped, uh, excuse me, scanned, it was digitally, the, uh, the, the matrix was digitally removed, exposing essentially the three-dimensional bones. And then those bones, the researchers on this paper, and I believe Chris may have been actually a co-author on this, I don't, I don't remember, but um, I was not a part of this project. But they, they, took this, they took the skeleton, they then segmented out all the hand bones, which they found many to be, and you can see here in the colorful uh, image, uh, all the different hand bones of this one individual, and then they could actually rearticulate it in three dimensions virtually. To then you can study even better. You can study the 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 the, the, the ratios between the digits, uh, the, the bones of the digits, the the shapes of the carpal bones, uh, divergence angles, all sorts of things that can help you know, interpret uh, how this animal may have used its hands in grasping or during locomotion. So virtual fossil preparation has really taken off as a field. Uh, with the uh, applications of micro CT and, and CT. Um, in my case, I study, I do a lot of functional comparative studies, um, which requires lots of data from extant uh, skeletal material. And while, uh, while costly, um, I can take a specimen from a museum, put it in a, in a, in a tube, a sample holder, and get scans at relatively very good resolution. For example, in this case, this is a monkey skeleton uh, of a hand and a foot uh, disarticulated and scanned at 50 microns. This is just zipping through the CT stack. You can actually get essentially a, a, a virtual uh, data set of, of comparative data, which then you can use for any comparative purposes. So for example, later on in the seminar, I'm going to be talking about uh, some studies on the second metacarpal of of hominins and then the first metatarsal or the hallux of, of some other primates. Uh, so, you know, I have these data, I can use them immediately, or I can, you know, I can save these data and share them with collaborators and create a whole lot of other projects. Um, and the, having this digital basically 
a museum of 3D data, whether it's just external anatomy or internal anatomy, uh, has really uh, been a great way to occupy my time during COVID and working with scientists both domestically and internationally and sharing a lot of these data with uh, students. Um, you could, of course, laser scan each bone separately, and it would be much, much cheaper to scan each bone, but the time to take to scan one bone versus the micro CT scan, all of these, uh, it's it's definitely worth the cost to, if you have grant money. So with all that said, I wanna talk about a, a couple of questions that can be addressed or have been recently addressed in uh, paleoanthropology and paleoprimatology as a field. Um, for example, uh, when and how did relative brain size increase in human evolution? It's not a question that I'm, specific, I'm specifically interested in or doing research on, but it is a question as just a human uh, interested in anthropology, interested in, in the evolution of our species, just knowing why we have such big brains and when did that big brain evolve? Maybe it's something that all of you or some of you have had an interest in. Uh, oops. Uh, more up to sort of in my in my in my wheelhouse of interest, uh, knowing and studying what, whether the earliest hominins, the earliest human ancestors were actually arboreal, like living apes are, um, like chimpanzees, for example. Um, we know that they were bipedal, like hum uh, as humans are, but there's also arguments that they all, uh, many of them uh, also had the ability to live in trees and move around in trees and climb trees and hang underneath trees and branches. And speaking of early hominins, uh, you know, can 3D imaging also help us improve or better understand uh, why advanced stone tool technology um, uh, doesn't uh, occur till you know later on in human evolution around 1.8 million, and maybe it's limited uh, uh, to sort of primitive tools in the earliest uh, human relatives because of differences in hand morphology. So we can actually use the 3D imaging to study these complex bones of the hands and wrists that I was mentioning. Uh, to get a better feel for uh, how their shapes differ from modern humans. Um, sticking with with other uh, uh, distal appendages, uh, my interest again being hands and feet. Um, I've been using uh, micro CT imaging on some very small fossils and very small primate comparative samples um, to study uh, pedal grasping and the evolution of, of, of grasping with the big toe. Uh, and so I'll talk about that. And then finally, um, recap what Chris talked about in terms of some of the uh, Rumnagur fossils, specifically how micro CT has facilitated our understanding of the phylogenetic relationships of those primates. Um, and then that will lead into one other last bit, which I'll get to. So let me tackle these uh, with a few slides each. Um, so we, we we all know, I think, that, that humans have uh, uh, sort of pound for pound uh, the largest brains uh, in among most all mammals and uh, relatively largest brains and definitely among uh, definitely uh, within primates. Um, our cranial capacity is approximately 1400 cubic centimeters. That of a chimpanzee is around 400, maybe a little bit less. And we know that our large brains are linked to things like language, uh, cultural complexity, tool use, uh, tool making uh, capabilities, and a lot of other things. And we also know that the that the you know the human brain um, has been evolving for at least four million uh, years, or so we think. Uh, and and what is that uh, that direction of of brain evolution? Well, we 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 kind of think, and based on our our, our sort of understanding is that there's this, there's this linear relationship or maybe a, a logarithmic increase uh, with time, uh, let's say around 4 million years to the present, uh, that cranial capacity uh, basically increases. Uh, and that makes sense. We, uh, we're smarter than uh, our, our distant relatives, the chimpanzees and other apes. Um, and there's data within this time period of, of a number of fossils that have shown that cranial capacity increases. Uh, recently, uh, in 2018, there was a really, really nice paper by uh, a group of scientists from George Washington University uh, who actually plotted and then also did some, uh, some robust uh, uh, statistics that I probably can't explain very well uh, that actually plotted um, uh, cranial capacity 
uh, so, sorry, endocranial volumes uh, in cubic centimeters along with their, their uh, against time. And what you can kind of see is that, that that line is basically there. You have this linear relationship or well logarithmic relationship since this is a, on a log scale uh, on the x-axis, excuse me, y-axis. Um, but it, it, it follows sort of the, the convention. But if you if what they decided to do is they took out, they, they, they decided to separate the, the actual groups of, of hominins here uh, based on sort of uh, uh, types. So they have this archaic type, which includes the Australopithecines uh, from, from East Africa and South Africa. Uh, and those are sort of in this red zone here, uh, you know, around uh, three and a half million to, to let's say two million years. Then they notice that amongst these these hypermegadont paranthropines and some other transitional forms of hominins roughly between 2 and 1.5 million you have this stasis of 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 time excuse me not not stasis of time you have this you have this short time interval but you have this large variation in uh, endocranial volumes um, some individual taxa that have really tiny brains uh, or reconstructed tiny brains and some that have you know, a much larger size brains. As opposed to that archaic group where you have basically this range of 400 to 600 cc's across a much longer period of time. And then you have this quick transition, but a lot of variation of increase. And then you have this nice linear, uh, or more of a gradual increase between time around, let's say 1.5, to 1.8 million uh, to the present where you get this increase in uh, endocranial volume. And these are all associated with the genus uh, Homo. So very elegant study that it's not really a straight linear relationship or a logarithmic relationship, but it differs based on what type of uh, hominin you're, you're talking about. Now, what's interesting though, is that all these data, some of these data extend back decades, um, calculated uh, um, sort of traditionally, you know, using mustard seed or, or water or something else that displaces some sort of volume uh, in these relatively complete skulls uh, that have been found over the many, uh, many years by many, many scientists. And the only, the most recent addition to this plot, according to, uh, my review of their uh, supplemental information is this data point right here, uh, right about 1.9 million years ago. Uh, it's a fossil hominin, which I'll show you in a second, uh, attributed to Australopithecus sediba, which was found just uh, in the last decade. And uh, it has, a, again, a low cranial capacity, just above 400, and it falls in this archaic uh, group of, of early hominins with basically a stasis of, of of endocranial volume. Now, what's interesting is that this data point here, its endocranial volume was calculated digitally with 3D methods. Now, again, my talk is about 3D methodologies, um, and so I'm going to focus on uh, how that of you know how this, these methods helped get that one data point, which is actually an important data point, as you know, as you can see, it extends that that Australopithecus uh, boundary to the 1.9. Uh, just over, uh, just below two million years ago. Uh, this is Australopithecus sediba. Uh, it's a really amazing skull found by the team of Lee Berger in South Africa at the University of Witwatersrand. Um, when they prepped it, they realized that I, I believe they realized that it's it's not just very complete, but it's also extremely fragile. So they decided not to actually uh, prep out the entire skull. Uh, from the inside out and had actually left this really hard matrix in place. And that's fine and it looks really interesting, but you lose a lot uh, that can be studied. For example, the basal cranium or anything, uh, the internal structures of the skull, or especially in this case, the endocranial volume. Um, so I believe what they did first was they, they tried to medical CT scan it uh, in South Africa and they found that, you know, you just really don't get very good resolution. The bone is too dense, the matrix is too dense. Uh, you can see the the dent the the enamel of this one tooth. It's a little fuzzy. So they uh, took it to France, where they where they uh, got synchrotron scanning, and you can see the quality of the scan is much 
much, uh, much, much better. Um, not just the the pixel resolution, but just um, just the overall clarity and the build, the ability to distinguish matrix from bone. Uh, you can see the same, basically uh, the same slice in these two uh, scans, uh, and how much better that um, the enamel is and the enamel dentine junction is. So uh, my, one of my colleagues at USC, he was not at USC at the time. He was actually at, at, in South Africa. Um, and I think Rajiv, you remember Chris, he, he worked uh, in India, uh, sorry, in Egypt with us that one year as well. Um, he segmented out this, yes. uh, this skull and he segmented out the, 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 the endocranial, um, uh, the, the cranial cavity uh, to create a basically virtual endocast. And he did that with other South African skulls and a chimpanzee skull and a human skull, and then was able to reconstruct this digitally with uh, a couple of assumptions and came up with a capacity of just over 400 cc's. And then this is some of their data from that paper. Here's sort of the a homo sapien range, modern humans, here's chimpanzees at 400. And then here are these virtual endocasts that were uh, measured by uh, his team. So that's how they got this data. Now this is with synchrotron. Um, and it's obviously a very cool thing. More recently, in fact, just two years ago, uh, a series of papers started coming about uh, from about this animal called Australopithecus prometheus, which is, uh, this is the skull of, of the skeleton, near complete skeleton uh, called Littlefoot, STW 573. Dated, it's a much older specimen dated uh, at 3.67 million years. Uh, the skeleton is, is really cool. I've seen it uh, in, a, in, in, the, in the museum. Uh, but it's got a lot of deformation. Um, it took so long to prep out and to the point where uh, Ron Clark, who who is the lead and the discoverer of the skeleton, uh, wasn't really able or didn't want to prep it out even more uh, to because he didn't want to uh, he wanted to avoid damaging the skull and all the other parts of the skeleton. And so uh, uh, Chris, my colleague, again, and, and others were still in, in South Africa and was working with, they were working together uh, and they micro CT scanned the entire skeleton at their facility uh, in, in uh, at the University of Witzwaterstrand. And they were, um, this this uh, woman, Emily Badeau, was able to um, segment out the brain and you can see, you know, the nice fine structures, you can see blood vessels and all sorts of things and obtain the, uh, the uh, a virtual uh, cast of, of the of the brain, and they were able to measure volume, and you can see that this individual also had a brain size of approximately four hundred cc's. Um, Lee Berger has had a lot of luck in the last decade, and also is uh, known for finding a treasure trove of fossils referred to as Homo naledi. Uh, uh, from the rising uh, rising star cave system, and you can see here uh, two skulls or partial skulls from a specimen DH1 and DH2. Um, and be, uh, you know, despite having actually four skulls and, and even parts of others, uh, there's nothing that was complete, and there was nothing that they could actually measure and uh, a brain volume on. Uh, so what they did was they actually laser scanned. They didn't have access to the, the micro CT, but they laser scanned and surface scanned all of the bones and then virtually put them together and made a composite skull of DH1 and DH2 that you can see here. And then from that, they also uh, created a virtual endocast. And then obviously when you have virtual reconstructions, you have to have estimates uh, of, of brain volume or any other measurement. And they also did this with a, a slightly smaller, more I think a juvenile skull, of specimens DH3 and DH4, um, where they put together virtually and mirror imaged parts together to create this uh, composite skull, uh, a virtual skull. And, and then from those, they estimated brain volume um, to around 565 to just over 400 uh, cc's. Uh, what's interesting here, all of these right here in these browns and reds are australopithecines, much older specimens. And then here we have uh, a tiny brain from the genus Homo. Now, if you put these in context uh, and put this back in these plots, again, here's that Sediva specimen that was already known in that plot by, by Du. Um, uh, here's the Prometheus that I've just added in here very quickly uh, and slightly loosely to show that you have um, 
basically this again pattern that, that's not changing across uh, several millions of years. And then here's this Homo naledi specimen that's really an outlier from this trend of 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 this sort of gradual uh, evolution in the genus Homo. So we have here a very tiny brained individual uh, around 300,000 years ago. So it doesn't really follow this evolutionary model of, of, of genus Homo. Uh, a more recent paper by uh, Holloway et al. in, in 2018 and PNAS uh, said, yes, you know, this brain is small, but when you actually look at the details, again, created from those 3D uh, uh, surface scans, they found that there are a whole bunch of features. And again, I'm not a brain expert, so I don't know the names of all these features, but uh, some of the, the sulci and gyri, um, some of the vasculature patterns that you see here are more similar to modern humans and those found in the uh, other fossils of the genus Homo than they are of chimpanzees. So here you have an individual who's tiny brained, but the shape and the organization of the brain is actually human-like. So what that means is that, well, uh, it means that we need to find more more brains um, and endocasts, whether it be uh, hopefully maybe through virtual methods um, that can fill in the time gap here, but also may fill in this gap that's missing. If I move on to um, some postcrania, one fundamental question uh, and something that I'm really interested in also is uh, the evolution of bipedality in, in modern humans. Only humans are the, are the truest bipedal uh, uh, primate and, and, and mammal in general. And a number of scenarios and hypotheses have been put forth to, to recreate the last common ancestor uh, of of chimpanzees and and apes in general with uh, with humans to see you know did we evolve from a suspensory animal or or a quadrumanous animal like an orangutan maybe a knuckle walker or some sort of generic arboreal or terrestrial quadruped like like monkeys are. and we know pretty much now that we did not our last common ancestor did not have any features related to terrestrial quadrupedalism or even knuckle walking uh, despite the debates that continue. Um, but really, uh, there's still heated debates, uh, despite the large amount of evidence that that our earliest, that last common ancestors, and even the early Australopithecines were suspensory. Uh, but we can continue arguing these things, and every time a new fossil is found, we can find more data to show and actually prove that that the earliest hominins were probably uh, uh, ex uh, displaying some sort of arboreal behaviors in addition to their terrestrial uh, bipedality, and so. Let's go going back to this little foot uh, skeleton, STW 573. There's that skull that we had just talked about in its brain. Here's the rest of that skeleton. This was described. Um, it's actually still being described in a series of papers. Um, this uh, skeleton it took like I believe it was like over 20 years to prep out, but the entire thing, or most of it, has actually now been micro CT scanned in South Africa. Uh, because of its uh, variable preservation and relatively fragile nature. And so what I wanna do is give two examples of two papers that have come out in 19, uh, 2019 and then uh, one in 2021. It shows evidence of arboreality actually from the skull um, or a part of the skull and then also from uh, the shoulder blade. So uh, Chris in his talk, uh, showed the semicircular canal system in that juvenile nyanzapithecine skull. Um, this type of uh, extraction of the semicircular canals goes back uh, uh, probably a, a little more than a decade, um, I think 2018, excuse me, tw uh, 2008, 2007-ish, I, I believe are some of the first studies where that was done, not necessarily in hominins. And this is just a paper from the Journal of Anatomy in 2012, just, just illustrating um, the location of that semicircular canal within the skull and it's just been segmented out. It's just more of a visual just to show you where these bones are in case you were not familiar with them. But you can extract these digitally uh, with some with some high resolution micro CT. Uh, and then you can do a variety of analyses on these isolated semicircular semicircular canals in virtual. You can do landmark based analyses like a, a geometric morphometrics. You can take uh, virtual calipers and measure lengths and widths. Um, related to you know these anterior and posterior and lateral canals. Uh, anyway, you, I think you can get the idea that 
many things can be done if you actually can access them and see them, whether it's in person, in you know, holding it in your hand or on a computer screen. So before talking about hominins, I do want to talk about how the sort of the form function relationship of these cellular circuit canals and and one of the first one of the sort of I think one of the a classic study now although I don't know how classic 2008 is um, demonstrated this relationship between cellular circuit canal morphology and locomotor behavior in primates and so what we see here uh, on this graph from this paper by uh, Alan Walker is we have here on the x-axis body mass. Um, and then on the y-axis, we have um, the length of the lateral semiocircuit circuit canal, uh, which is this one right here, compared to here. And this is a plot of strepsorine primates, this, which includes the lemurs of Madagascar and the lorises uh, and galagos. And what you can see here are the slow moving lorises uh, have very uh, small values of lateral semicircular canal uh, length compared to the more agile leaping uh, um, uh, 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 indriid uh, 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 lemurs uh, found in Madagascar and shown here in red. So there's this difference between the morphology of like fast moving versus slow moving. Uh, and then these, these these taxa in these white squares are basically more or less arboreal quadrupeds that can do a little bit of everything. So you have this nice uh, morphocline uh, from slow to fast movers. And this paper was really focused on on these giant extinct Malagasy lemurs from, um, that went extinct in the, the 1900s um, to see what were they doing in terms of their locomotion. Um, so this giant rec this reconstruction of something called a megalatopus or the koala lemur was reconstructed right here to have some of your canals that are very loris like if you scaled them up in size and then even a small smaller value uh of for, for its size of the semicircuit canal uh, length is this animal called um uh, paleopropithecus which we refer to or has been referred to as the sloth lemur because of its Reconstruct and be basically a below branch, slow moving quadruped like extant sloths are in uh, Southern and Central America. So clearly, there's a relationship between uh, semicircular canal morphology and uh, agility, uh, if you will, or performance uh, in trees. And so, uh, again, uh, Another paper by uh, Boudot, it's not the same one as the brain one, but a separate paper uh, in the same year, uh, took uh, and segmented out the uh, the uh, semiosecret circuit canals from this little foot Australopithecus prometheus skull, and then performed a, a variety of analyses, including a shape analysis uh, and some length analyses on these canals. They also studied the cochlea, but I'm not going to talk about those. Uh, the results from their study showed that um, you can separate out uh, modern humans from chimpanzees here in red, uh, which probably is linked to differences in locomotor behavior. We have, you know, we're, 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 we're bipeds here, or chimpanzees that do a variety of things, including swinging in trees and climbing in trees. Um, and then the australopithecines are all here in this purple space. And then there's some robust Australopithecines, the Paranthropus uh, taxa that are, are here. But basically, these fossil Australopithecines are in between modern humans and chimpanzees, and even the little foot specimen right here in this blue star straddles that, that border of, of chimpanzees, suggesting that it was, again, probably a little bit more uh, arboreal than, than, or it was at least arboreal. Uh, unlike modern humans. And then this is just a more of a linear measurement, uh, a relative uh, canal length, uh, showing that it overlaps here with extant chimpanzees and not humans. So here we have using 3D imaging, uh, specifically micro CT to extract the semi-sugar canals to show that little foot probably used some arboreal behaviors. Now, 
that's a nice correlation between skulls and behavior. But obviously, if we're talking about swinging in trees or being in trees, we probably want to have some data from the skeleton itself, you know, the arms, you know, which are the ones that are actually being used to hang from trees or climb trees. Um, and the scapula or the shoulder blade is a classic, is a, is, a, is, a, is a very appropriate bone to study if available in the fossil, because we know that humans, which don't hang from trees, have a different scapula morphology than those of the apes. And one of the key features that, that apes have, especially chimpanzees and gorillas, you can see that this, uh, what we have, what we call it, it's a cranially oriented um, uh, glenoid fossa. This is the, uh, the joint that articulates the humerus to form the shoulder joint. Uh, that, that cranially oriented as opposed to laterally oriented side to side orientation um, is important because it allows uh, the arm uh, to be elevated above the head with greater mobility as opposed to being on the side like in a modern human. And then these are some fossils of australopithecines that have shown uh, that that cranial orientation it holds true uh, in in these australopithecines, you know, obviously this is highly fragmentary. This is the actual the scapula fragment of the famous Lucy skeleton. Oh, and I believe one of these is from Sediba. Um, anyway, if you look at the data of this angle, this glenoid, uh, it's called a glenoid bar angle. Um, there's a difference between humans and chimpanzees and gorillas and orangutans, and then most of these fossils uh, fall out with this um, ape cluster as opposed to this human cluster. Now, Littlefoot has two scapula. Uh, one is uh, badly damaged. Actually, they're both badly damaged, but one is more complete. The, the right scapula is much more complete, as you can see here. But you can also see in this image that it's extremely fragmentary. And, and again, the uh, Ron Clark, the lead on this, um, and his collaborators, decided this is way too fragile to set to actually uh, to prep out and it would be better to study it uh, with um, micro CT imaging to study it virtually, whether we need to take some measurements like this um, or just to get a better visual of it. So again, my, my colleague, uh, Chris Carlson at USC was involved in the digital prep of this specimen and was published this past year in Journal of Human Evolution. And he shared with me this video, which I'm going to play for you. It's about a minute long but I'll speed it up to show you really the sort of the, not, I mean, this is really, it's a, it's a cool presentation uh, of the fossils themselves being scanned and then um, being digitally prepped and then put back together. And so I thought it would be worth sharing. Um, so uh, I have to, there's some little bug in the thing, but I will just fast forward here. There's the, there's the, um, there's some text that he provided me. Uh, this is shared by him uh, of the scapula, and then just showing you where we are. And then let me just get to this. Sorry, I think there we go. It will transition here shortly. That's the facility of the micro CT scanner in South Africa. It, the video will now show some internal anatomy. You can see that. You can well, you could have seen that there's the bones. Now here he segmented out all of the different fragments of that scapula, figured out how to put it back together based on the shapes of the bones, but also the internal structure of the bone, like the, the trabecular bone inside to see how they fit best, and then put it back together virtually, essentially virtual uh, preparation. And then um, I'll just speed this up now because the rest of it is just a visual, just to show that you can do this, which is very exciting, but it has importance in that it now basically allows us, or allowed them to have a more complete reconstructed scapula, which now measurements can be taken from, whether they be just basic measurements like this glenoid bar angle, and you can see here where little foot falls out, right with the uh, ape range and all these other australopithecine fossils, or some other measurements, uh, for example, here, this axillary border and spine angle, or the, 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 the relationship between the supraspinous fossa and infraspinous fossa. Um, and there are a, a number of other metrics that they took, and they also did a three-dimensional geometric morphometric analysis. But in the end, 
what they found is that this scapula, once it was reconstructed uh, from all those tiny parts, really is uh, is ape-like. And it's, it's like other australopithecines. And when they do a, a multivariate analysis, you can see that that uh, little foot uh, scapula clusters with other australopithecines and are, is part of a larger cluster that includes chimpanzees and gorillas. And these are outside the cluster of modern humans and another uh, fossil uh, Homo erectus from uh, Kenya. So again, the 3D imaging, and that's sort of the theme here, uh, helped recreate or helped reconstruct that, that really fragmentary scapula through virtual preparation and allowed, us, allowed these researchers to measure it and, and conclude uh, I think pretty well with that that is that it is um, and has arboreal tendencies. So those studies on the brain and on arboreality and littlefoot were other people's studies, and I'll only just briefly mention two, you know, uh, two of my studies. The first is um, of whether about stone tool making and hand morphology. We know that the earliest stone tools uh, come from a site called Lamekwi in Kenya about 3.3 million years ago. These are very simple primitive tools. I'm not an archeologist, but I can tell that these are not that advanced uh, of technology. More advanced tools like those found uh, related to the Ashleyan uh, industry uh, start to appear in, in, the, in the fossil record or the archeological record around 1.8 million years. Now, what's interesting is that the some of the derived features that we have in our hands as modern humans also appear around two million years in the fossil record. Um, so that kind of makes you think. Well, why is it that is it is there a link here between modern human hand morphology um, and advanced tool making, advanced stone tool making, in addition to obviously brain expansion and, and larger brain size? Um, and is it something in the hand that possibly uh, uh, something that might be primitive in shape or in structure uh, in the Australopithecus hand that limit their abilities to make anything that wasn't very complex? And if you look here at this very nice complete hand of Australopithecus sediba around 1.9 million years ago, um, studies on it, with you know basic studies. Uh, have shown that you know the digit proportions are a little bit like Homo sapiens, but not terribly different from some of the other uh, gorillas, for example. Obviously, they don't look like gorilla hands uh, in terms of all of their their slenderness and 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 and, and relative robusticities. Uh, but you know more can be done, especially if we're talking about complex wrist motions, which are needed to nap. Uh, and flake off pieces of rock to form tools, it might be something related to the complex in here within the wrist. And if we look very superficially here, um, and we look at the base of these second metacarpals, right here and here, and we look at this anatomy, you can see that the human hand is different from, um, I know these are illustrations, are, is different from, from the apes. And then you can see that that you know, it, at least in Australopithecus sediba here, there's a different morphology than we see in this illustration of a human. Now, how do you study complex shapes? Um, you can't you can't just like take calipers to them; it's too complex. Um, you can describe them in words; that that's always a good thing. But I think what we what again what my colleagues and I have been doing is digitizing um, second metacarpals among other bones uh, to do uh, more complex. Um, morphometrics uh, of these regions of of the wrist complex to see if australopithecines and in, and other fossils are more or less like uh, are more like humans or more like apes, and maybe that will provide us uh, an answer or a part of an answer for this question up here about um, why early hominins were not capable of making advanced stone tools. So here is a nice. Um, micro CT rendering of, uh, of, a, of a human, um, sorry, this is not human. Uh, I think this is a chimpanzee. Um, um, metacarpal, second metacarpal. Um, you, you don't need micro CT for this. Laser scanning, surface scanning would be enough because we're just looking at an external morphology. Um, 
but by having these these kinds of virtual data, we can take a, a whole number of landmarks on them. Here we have uh, over 25 landmarks on both the proximal uh, and distal ends of these bones. We can run a variety of analyses, uh, geometric morph analyses, um, uh, followed by Procrustes and then some PCAs. Uh, and we can plot these results and see sort of group separation. So here we have on this plot, uh, uh, the principal component one on the x-axis against principal component three, which is counting for just about 12% of the total variation. Uh, the x-axis is really size, uh, so we can ignore it. The uh, y-axis is is really more of the shape of these, of these bones uh, linked to the proximal end. Uh, and we can see that humans are clustering down here, and then you have the apes clustering over here. And you can see that the australopithecines are really, you know, they're kind of straddling the, the boundary between modern humans and gorillas, and some are actually better overlapped with gorillas. So to me, again, this is still preliminary. We, we need more data. We can see that the australopithecus second metacarpals are not really human-like. Uh, and then again, this may be just one possible, not the reason, but one possible contribution for not making, not being able to make advanced stone tools. Um, that was the hands. Now, if we if we move down to the feet, which I have written uh, a lot about, uh, one of the questions that that I'm interested in and have been for quite a while is: Did the earliest primates have grasping feet like primates? Uh, did the earliest primates have grasping feet like living primates do? And when did this grasping uh, foot, specifically big toe grasping, evolve in, in the order of primates? Um, this illustration I really like because uh, it shows hands and feet of a variety of apes and monkeys. Um, and if you haven't really stared at, at hands and feet of monkeys, they look very similar. And so here I'm just highlighting the, the feet, specifically the big toes of feet of a variety of these different uh, primates. And you can see that they have these, you know, opposable big toes that are really great for grasping small branches or big branches or climbing or whatever it might be. And then some, you know, have smaller big toes that are not really used that much for anything. More of a strut just for when standing or, or, or walking. Um, we know that from from studies of, of living animals that not all primates use their big toe uh, the same way in pedal grasping. Some will have a grasp between their first, their big toe and their second toe, that's called one, two grasping. Some will grasp strongly between their first digit and their fifth digit um, around a branch that's referred to as one, five grasping. Uh, anthropoid primates, which include the monkeys, um, and apes tend to have uh, what, we, what we refer to as derived uh, limited grasping abilities. They're still grasping, but they're not like the 1-5 uh, or 1-2 graspers, which are uh, typically your uh, strepsorine uh, lemur and lorises. Now, how can we study uh, evolution of halical grasping? Uh, well, we can study the hallux which is illustrated right here, wrapped around a branch. Uh, specifically, we can study the anatomy of the first metatarsal the, uh, or the halical metatarsal. And, and why, why this bone, well, obviously it's important for pedal grasping, but also there's a quite a large number of them in the, in the primate fossil record dating back to uh, the early Middle Eocene. Uh, here are some uh, 3D reconstructions from micro CT scans of these small uh, first metatarsals. Here we have some extant uh, monkeys from the old world and from the new world showing some variation in, in anthropoid metatarsal one anatomy. Uh, this is actually another small monkey. Uh, here we have a different morphotype of lemurs and lorises and galagos, these strepsorines, extant strepsorines. You can see uh, some key features, for example, since they're all scaled to the same length, you can see that these are much more robust than these are over here. They have different articular surface morphologies uh, and these processes that don't exist in these anthropoids. Their heads are different shaped. So these are tiny bones, uh, not, 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 not rodent micromammal tiny, but, but small. They're not like a human femur. And so the imaging that we that we uh, that we obtained helps facilitate the study of these. And I showed you that uh, 
that CT scan earlier uh, with all the bones that were reconstructed. And, you know, we, for many years, we collected from museums uh, scans of complete hands and feet, and we were able to digitize and segment out these isolated skeletal remains, which then come in handy uh, when we want to actually study isolated fossil metatarsals or other fossil bones. So here we have two fossils from the Eos, excuse me, from the Oligocene of Egypt, Catopithecus and Egyptopithecus, 34 million and 30 million years ago, approximately. Uh, here is a fossil uh, Adipoides. This is a, an extinct strepsirine uh, clade, uh, somewhat related to lemurs. These are found in Eurasia. And then here's another adapid primate uh, from the Eocene of North America. Um, don't really need to say much that how this anatomy and this anatomy is much more similar to these, hence making them linked to, strep to strepsirine uh, anatomical features. And these are clearly anthropoid. But of course, being a comparative anatomist, we can't just look at them and call them anthropoids. We need to do a whole lot of analyses and measurements. Um, so we, because we, they were all virtual and we had several hundred of these specimens, uh, not several hundred fossils, but several hundred uh, extant skeletal specimens, uh, and um, and these fossils digitized, we were able to take a whole bunch of measurements uh, from them. These are just listing some of these measurements that we took, including angle measurements. Uh, we were also able to, in this study, uh, published quite a while ago now, uh, actually create a, a character list of first metatarsal morphology, which, were this, which was then used in a cladistic analysis. Uh, but the results from a discriminant analysis, uh, multivariate analysis, shows that anthropoid morphology is very different from uh, strepsirine morphology, and all these black boxes represent different fossils that we were able to put into the analysis. And Catopithecus and Egyptopithecus here are more anthropoid, are obviously anthropoid like, and then those adapids that I showed are strepsirine like. And what's really interesting is, and I don't have a picture of it unfortunately, is this animal called Eosimius, which is from the earliest uh, Eocene of China, and it has anatomy that is more like a strepsirine, but its craniodental features are more haplorine like which would place it with tarsiers or even anthropoids. So the earliest primate or the earliest haplorine primate has a big toe that is actually more strepsirine like rather than being more haplorine like. If we do the same analysis but rather than by taxon or phylogenetics we, we, we character code them based on function that is a derived grasp like an anthropoid a 1-2 grasp or a 1-5 grasp, we get something really cool. We get uh, both Egyptopithecus and Catopithecus have that anthropoid, anthropoid-like grasping abilities already in the Oligocene. And the uh, Eosimius, that, that, that really early Eocene uh, taxon, actually has a very primitive 1-5 grasp that you see in things like lorises. So the earliest haplorines uh, primates are clearly have a very primitive grasping big toe, which is very uh, exciting, that, or well, one of the more exciting found, finds for that paper. And that just uh, sort of summarizes that early Oligocene anthropoids had pedal grasping mechanics like extant anthropoids. Um, because we have micro CT scans of all these things, uh, we don't need to just look at the external anatomy. We can look at the internal structure of these bones. Here's a nice little video I made showing you the cortical structure of, of one of these um, uh, uh, first metatarsals. I don't actually remember which, which taxon that is. I should have wrote that down. Um, I think it's a loris. But anyway, you can see the internal anatomy here. Uh, we can take across the, the cr a cross section of that digitally at mid shaft say, let's say somewhere around here, and we can measure its cortical properties uh, and scale it to length uh, and some other variables, for example, uh, an estimate of body mass, and see if animals like anthropoids versus strepsirines differ in their uh, measures of bone strength. And what we find is that uh, anthropoid primates with their derived limited grasping abilities in the foot have weaker or mechanically weaker um, first metatarsals compared to 
most strepsorine primates shown in um, green here. And then shown in red here are the lorises, which have uh, basically more robust, more skeletally uh, 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 rigid uh, first metatarsals, which explains, which, which makes sense considering that they have these really weird pincer-like uh, feet for their uh, primitive 1-5 grasps versus, you know, lemurs, whether they're small or big, have uh, a 1-5 or a 1-2 grasp um, mostly one, two, and then your anthropoids like these monkeys here, or even chimpanzees that have a less uh, abducted hallux and their grasping is really limited to more larger diameter structures. So there's this nice separation in, in living primates between anthropoids, most strepsorines, and then lorises. And then what's really interesting, if, now it's been quite a while, but um, this actually undescribed specimen here of Caronesia, uh, also from the Fayum of Egypt in the Eocene from a locality called BQ2. Uh, we're still working on this paper. Um, has been argued from its teeth to be either a basal loris or a basal strepstrine. It's still a little bit up in the air. Um, but either way, we have scans of this specimen and we can measure its cortical bone structure. And if it's a basal loris, you know, is that specimen, does its bone strength fall with lorises or does it fall with strepsorines? Or maybe it falls with uh, anthropoids, we don't, uh, won't know until I tell you. Um, but if it falls in with lorises, then it would suggest, and this is it happens to be a basal loris, then we'll know that at least loris-like grasping abilities evolved as early as, uh, at least by the uh, late Middle Eocene. But if it's a loris and it had uh, um, more strepsorine-like uh, grasping a 1-5, then it would suggest that loris, extant loris morphology um, and bone strength is is derived within extant lorises or if it was derived later on and not primitive for the group. So this is actually where the Caronesia specimen falls. It falls in this 1-5 lemur line and not with the, excuse me, 1-2 lemur line and not with the uh, lorises that are capable of this really, really strong, powerful grasps. Uh, so essentially, extant lorises have derived pedal grasping mechanics compared to potentially Eocene relatives. Now, if this turns out to be, from its dental morphology, uh, a basal strepsorine, then it, 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 that's also a fine story, not as exciting as if it was a basal loris. But either way, that we know then at least basal strepsorines had their bone strength properties uh, as back as 37 million years ago. Okay. So those are studies um, with specific questions related to paleoanthropology and paleoprimatology uh, and how 3D imaging has helped us answer or help resolve some of those uh, issues. Uh, obviously, uh, imaging alone can't solve everything. But what I want to do is now is talk about briefly some fossils from India. And luckily, Chris, in the previous seminar, actually basically said everything I wanted to, so I don't need to belabor the point. Um, and I can jump really quickly to the last uh, two slides. But uh, I'll just recap that our, our collaboration with uh, Rajiv and uh, others uh, at Punjabi University, including two of his grad students um, at the Wadi Institute of Familiar Geology, where now Premjit is, is located, uh, Dr. Sagal uh, also working with him, and then most recently, another grad student, Abhishek Singh. Um, hence, these are the asterisks for students. Uh, with our U.S. Uh, counterparts, uh, we have two Chris's, one you met earlier, and then Chris Camposano, who uh, works with Rajiv and, and, and will work with Deepak on geology, and then, and then uh, me, who's more or less doing a lot of the, the digitizing work. So this is a nice photo of us from 2015, the Rumnagar field team, when we were lucky enough to go to the field very often, you know, once a year and look for fossils and enjoy uh, the nice climate up in uh, Jammu and Kashmir. Um, unfortunately, now uh, in the last two years, we haven't been able to go to the field. Um, and so now this is a nice picture of our 2021 Ramnagar Zoom team. Uh, we, we were discussing some uh, micro mammals that uh, Dr. Segal has found and that Premjit and Abhishek are working on to publish. Um, 
this is just a, a one of the one of the nice rodents that uh, is in the paper um, that is uh, under review. Uh, I won't say too much about it since it's still under review. But again, we're talking about a very tiny tooth that we micro scanned at uh, three microns to produce really nice images that will actually aid in the study of these specimens that we think that uh, just SEM alone won't be able to, to accomplish. Uh, also, the, the, the having these Zoom meetings and, and is, is, is fantastic to keep in touch with each other and having these digital data are fantastic because this keeps us occupied and keeps us working on these materials when we can't actually go to the field. And hopefully next year uh, that will change and we can actually go back to the field with uh, Rajiv and, and Premjit and everybody else. Um, here are the primates of Ramnagar. Uh, uh, Chris spoke about uh, the Shiva Pithecus tooth that Dr. Segal found and we have described. Uh, he talked about copy, the, the, extant, uh, the extinct gibbon um, that he found and has now been described. And then he briefly touched on the uh, Ramatopus um, uh, uh, adapted primate, uh, an extinct relative of living, leapers, uh, living, living lemurs that Premjit had found and then we described in, in 2017. So what you notice from all of these, and again, uh, with my seminar being about 3D imaging, is that you can see really great anatomy from, uh, from with micro CT scan data. And actually you can see some really good data if, uh, from high resolution surface scanning if you have, uh, if, the, if the specimens are big enough. And they actually, uh, the, the newest scanners actually would do quite well on a Shiva Pithecus tooth. Uh, okay on, on a Rheumatopus, but not so well on, on copy, which is quite small. Um, but you, again, you wouldn't get the internal structures, which are things that we are still looking into in at least these two specimens. Um, briefly, uh, Chris touched on this very, uh, uh, as well that, you know, we're sitting up here in Rumnagar, we have now apes, we have an adapid, and it's really neat to see these extinct taxa on here, especially when you think about where are their closest living relatives located today, right? You have in China, Southeast Asia, you have the gibbons that you can sort of illustrate it here. It's only on Orang uh, uh, Borneo and Sumatra where orangutans are found today. Uh, lemurs are isolated to the to Madagascar, but in the Miocene, you know, obviously the 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 the, the paleofauna would have been much more diverse. It's definitely diverse in primates. There were also other Shivala dapids and adapids living all through here and then in Eurasia as well. So uh, a lot of very 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 fun things coming out of the ground uh, with our with our field work and important things. And the use of imaging has really facilitated us in determining uh, what these things are. So um, Chris, I, and I, I will admit that this image I just took from Chris's presentation while he was giving it because it made me realize that a lot of studies prior to our own of these small primates, uh, when they're, and this is no fault to the, to the authors, this is what was available at the time, a lot of their studies relied on illustrations as you can see here, this Pliopithecus uh, and this Barbaropithecus um, specimens, or they relied on, you know, photographs that you can't see too well, or extremely blurry images of, of, of teeth, which you could probably get a maximum length and width out of it, very little in anatomical detail. And then you can just see, you know, not to boast too much, but just the great quality of, of anatomical detail you can get from uh, 3D imaging, like micro CT, you can see cracks in the teeth, you can see wear facets. Um, I don't study teeth, so I can't explain every single cusp like Chris can, but uh, I can at least see, you know, there are uh, just, just amazing detail. And I have an undergrad student right now who's segmenting out the enamel cap so that she can measure the enamel volume and then we can quantify the shapes of the, of the, of the dentine. Um, so, by having these teeth uh, uh, virtually available to us, um, it helped Chris out and, and, and a few of the other colleagues on that paper uh, to character code the teeth and, and run a cladistic analysis. Uh, it also allowed uh, Alejandra, who Chris mentioned, to take landmarks and run geometric morphometrics on these teeth. And then 
uh, run some analyses that showed that the the shapes of based on these 14 landmarks um, demonstrates clearly that copy is a high love added. I'm, again, not to, I don't need to go into more detail since Chris already did that, and hopefully you guys were at his talk. Uh, and these are the same graphs that or figures that he had showed just to show that both whether it's the neighbor joining analysis of 14 landmarks or the or the cladistic analysis, uh, again, eight the characters character coding aided from that 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 three D data um, shows that copy is reconstructed as a stem hyaline batted uh, primate. Um, if we go back to this uh, Ramatopus specimen here, this is a photograph, uh, a little blurry here, but we micro CT scan this specimen and it actually, we did it first just to make 3D images of it just so that we can have it for, for virtual study. But when we, we actually looked into the bone and we looked, we took a, a basically a slice through the, the, the mandible uh, corpus here and through the uh, M1, and then we took a perpendicular slice here through through the uh, through the body uh, at the level of the P4 root. We found that you can actually see the alveolar socket, and you can actually see a part of a a, a, a premolar distal root, and you can see the premolar uh, P4 uh, mesial root. By having that root and that alveolar socket uh, visible through thanks to you know the 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 imaging um we were able to uh, estimate uh the 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 length sort of a minimum and maximum estimate of a length of a p4 here this is obviously drawn in but uh based on other measurements of p4 uh of shivla date beans in 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 that have been published um we basically reconstructed this thing to be approximately 5.2 millimeters and then we, we take that as a ratio against M1 length. We found that with the estimates that we had, it clearly falls out as a Shibla adapine and not one of the other uh, uh, adapids from uh, uh, Asia and elsewhere. So that was pretty neat. How, again, imaging fortuitously helped us uh, uh, reconstruct premolar uh, uh, length uh, uh, dimensions which then allowed us to create this ratio, which allowed us to confirm that it overlaps as Shiva beans. And then that ratio became one of 40 characters in a Bayesian tip dating analysis, which then allowed us to place um, uh, uh, Ramatopus in a more firm context, uh, as well as within a date between, you know, let's say 12 to, to 14 million years or roughly around then. So that was very that was very uh, uh, lucky. We honestly took the images just for for the pictures, and then we uh, got a lot more out of it, and actually can get more out of it uh, moving forward. Okay, um, that's again Ramatopus is is reconstructed as a Shiva date bean primate. So those are primates. We have other fossils, obviously, from Rumnagar. Um, here is a really nice. Uh, surface scan uh, of, of Alistriodon. Uh, this is a, one of the historical specimens from the Yale Peabody Museum collected in the 1930s, I believe. Uh, this is just an occlusal view of two molars, uh, maxillary molars. Here's that same rodent that uh, Premjit and Dr. Segal are, are describing and we're assisting in with the imaging um, and also the bio biochronology analyses. Um, to show that we have micro mammals that can be imaged and, and studied. And then we have something um, which is really cool uh, from a site called Kulwanta, where we have this giant crocodile tooth, uh, which we believe is a Ramphosuchus. Uh, it was actually found in uh, four pieces by, by myself. Um, actually, I didn't find the tip and then Rajiv said, go back and go find the tip and I found the tip. <laughs> um, but we scanned it and now we can do a number of analyses on this if we wanted to, for example, we can measure diameters and, and perimeters of this specimen compared to other giant crocodiles uh, that, uh, that roam the earth at this time period during the Chinji formation age. 
Now, if you're interested, this is now more of a, the rest of it is now, uh, I have two more slides, and this is really a, a, just a, more of a sales pitch and advertising. But if you want to see more of our, our digitized uh, Ramnagar fossils, you know, please visit uh, morphosource.org. Uh, you can type in and search for our project, which is called Shabalik Fossils from Ramnagar. Uh, of Jammu Kashmir. Uh, you, here's a QR code if you want to take out your smartphones and snap this. Um, or you can contact Rajiv or myself later and I can send you the link. Uh, but basically right now we have about 70 specimens from the Yale Peabody Museum, Punjab University, and then uh, just one or two from Wadia right now. Um, uh, I have an undergraduate student who's actually scanning more. Uh, and then these will be put on to Morphosaurus. Initially we'll put um, uh, only published material, but eventually, and and eventually, hopefully, everyone will publish their material, and then everything will become open source and made accessible to others. Um, and we have a reason for this. We're not just doing this to collect fossils and to have people share them and look at them and download them, but really, there's a reason why we're doing this, and this is and because we think there's some real benefits to developing a virtual repository. The area, of, you know, the region of Rumnagar and the fossil localities have been worked on and off since the 1930s. And one of the first uh, expeditions was from the American Museum of Natural History. Um, and most fossils ended up going back to New York City. Some of those were shared with the Yale Peabody Museum, hence getting these access to these historical collections. Other specimens exist at the Wadia Institute. Other specimens exist at Punjab University. And there are more, of course. And that's because lots of researchers have an interest in this area and lots of researchers have been collecting fossils. Uh, one of the downsides of having lots of people and lots of collections is that it makes it really hard to comprehensively study all of the material. Um, and so our goal really is to create a virtual one-stop shop of the fossils from Rumnagar. Um, we, we need this so that we can study these materials so that we can ask some fundamental questions about the Rumnagar region, such as uh, a better um, uh, assessment of the taxonomy of the animals that are there, um, with knowing of the taxonomy, we can maybe get a better idea of better of the paleobiology of a lot of these animals that live there, not just the primates, of course, the paleoecology of the whole area. Um, biochronology uh, can be addressed by just basically knowing what's there and what's been there and who's collected what and making things uh, just accessible. Um, once we have a better, uh, uh, a better answers to these fundamental questions, we can then uh, perform better correlations and comparisons with other Chinji formation age sites, for example, like the classic sites at Platwar Plateau or even those uh, uh, in Eurasia elsewhere. And then finally, what we think that this, the benefits of this virtual repository will hopefully will promote collaboration among scholars like ourselves and our team uh, and doing field work in the same regions in the same time periods, right? There's, uh, I think collaboration now is extremely important. Um, especially when it comes to uh, pandemics, when we, we, a lot of us can't go to the field and a lot of us have fossils that are sitting around uh, that haven't been described or can't be described because maybe they're too small or too complex or they're stuck in matrix or, or whatever it might be. I think working together um, with all our different skill sets and interests, I think we can actually uh, all do some, uh, continue to do some more uh, uh, excellent science. Uh, re regarding this project here on Morphosaurus, eventually we hope to make it fully open access, um, starting with uh, published material and then eventually for those of, you know, that even ourselves, we're, we're not going to write a manuscript for every single fossil, so we'll probably make our entire collection openly accessible and openly downloadable. Of course, with that said, uh, the collectors themselves and the institutions that have that maintain these specimens or house these specimens will maintain full copyrights and access permissions uh, because ultimately it's it's their fossils it, it belongs to the country and the nation that they were found in uh, it doesn't belong to us because we just because we digitize them we're just here to help share and promote science so with that said i will end uh my talk and i just want to thank rajiv and all of you for being here and then our funding institutions, especially most recently the National Science Foundation, which is helping fund that digital uh, data collection. Okay, and you can stop sharing. All right. Thank you, Biren, for such a wonderful talk. Uh,
taking us to the virtual world where we could <clears throat> reconstruct so many things which we can't even see from uh, our naked eyes so uh, it's a it's a huge uh, bonus uh, that the technology has uh, given us and i i'm sure the new generation the next generation would take uh, the maximum benefit out of it uh, uh, and uh, and now that uh, we now that we are going to share the fossils in the virtual world uh, uh, this would uh, sort of revolutionize in the sense that uh, uh, that uh, people can can download can see the specimens for themselves can study them just by clicking uh, their mouse so no need to visit uh, spend a lot of money time and energy to to go to labs uh, that are situated uh, far away from where you are working so absolutely it's uh, the, the 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 future is uh, very very uh, bright in this sense uh, so i would i would uh, uh, request uh, 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 the students and 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 other participants to to uh, to go ahead uh, they can switch they can switch on their mics and can ask or they can put their queries in the in the chat box so uh, let me, uh, of course let me, it is uh, yeah yeah please, so please. let me before, before taking questions i just want to make one point you know our data is virtual um that doesn't mean if you don't have an opportunity or you if you do have the means and you do have the need you should always visit the actual yeah. fossil that is always the most important thing. that's true but yeah, we know yeah, that absolutely. obviously uh, geopolitical issues, climate issues, um, uh, pandemics, financial resources are, are limited, and so we're just hoping that this creates an, an an opportunity for more study when you can't get to see the real fossils. Um, right, but um, this is a good starting place to see what's available, or it's also a good place if you go into Morphosaurus and you're an expert on triangulates. Mm -hmm. And you look at our specimens, and we've labeled something incorrectly. This is a good place for you to tell us, yeah. "Hey, that's a wrong, that's a wrong description." Please wrong, change. Yeah. And these are the reasons. So it will actually make things more correct, um, so that right. everyone's on the same page with, even at the very least, taxonomy. Right. Right. All right. So, so uh, uh, questions are welcome. I know it's uh, it's, uh, it's midnight. Past, I think <laughs> midnight uh, for for uh, brain. So so you can ha have some few few quick questions if there are. Perhaps you can also uh, you can email me too. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, good afternoon. <laughs> Yeah, so, Akshay, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, so yeah, yeah, we can hear you, Akshay. Bit uh, worried. Like uh, we are seeing everything on virtual way. So can we make that virtual a uh, cast of that fossil so that we can study more easily about that uh, taxonomy or anything about that fossil? Can we do so that? you can. Um, that's a good question. Uh, it it the 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 downloading and printing of the of the specimens is up to the researcher that provided access to that original fossil or the collection uh or the collection um rules so for example the american museum of natural history we don't have any specimens of them but there some of these original ones will have them in the next few months they'll be on morphosaurus if you're interested in downloading them you can make a request through the platform and it will send an email to the collection manager and you have to put a you know a, a one or two sentence statement of why you want to study it um in most cases they always agree but i believe that museum doesn't allow you to print so you'll have to then open up that 3d model on your own computer but there's a lot of uh, open source uh, software programs like mesh lab um i'll just type that into the chat box uh, if you're not familiar with Mesh Lab, um, that's open source, works on PCs and Macs, uh, and you can download these ply files and you can study them virtually. It is nice to hold things, but a lot of these are such small teeth, and that printing them, it, it would, it, 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 it almost doesn't, it's not worth it unless you want to blow it up, you know, 10, 15 times 
and then print it out. Um, but I think Rajiv, for our PU specimens that we've published, we we we're not opposed to people printing and 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 downloading. No, no, open. not at all. Yeah. Nope. So, but but it's going to depend on the collection and the and the collection manager and the rules of that institution. Manage. Uh, and we're not we're not mandating yeah. anyone that shares data with us to do one thing or another. It's really up to them. We're just providing the service and the platform so that we so that people can see what's available. True. In the Ramnagar region of the Indian Shavalks. Hopefully other people will yeah. make another one for Hari Tal Younger, or maybe someone will make one for Kutch or some or whatever it might yeah, be yeah, in yeah. the future. Right. This is a, this right. is just a model. Let's we'll see how Absolutely. it works. But don't be afraid to email yeah. the people that in each 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 specimen it'll say who the copyright holder is, who is the publisher, and that sort of thing. And then you can make a request. And a lot of the specimens right now that are up there will just say open download, so you can just download them. But if it says no 3D printing, then you should honor that by not 3D printing. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Right. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah, I think I just want to mention one last thing. I, I think you now India has some really great micro CT imaging facilities um, right. scattered throughout the, the country. Um, yeah. And it's actually much cheaper to scan there than it is to scan here in the U.S. <laughs> so, yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. But um, I don't know how accessible it is right now because of COVID and and restrictions and things like that. Yeah, they are they are up slowly. Yeah. Now, now I think uh, uh, IIT Rupert uh, we can we can uh, access. I guess so. So. Well, okay. It seems, uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Biren. And uh, no, my pleasure. For, it, was, for, it was very fun. Uh, yeah. All yeah. right. Yeah. Goodbye, everyone. Yeah. Stay, yeah. stay thank healthy and goodbye, safe. Goodbye, goodbye. Thank, thank you, you all thank for you, joining. Thank, thank you so you. much, sir. Thank you. Welcome, welcome.